Bayang magiliw, perlas ng silanganan, alab ng puso, sa dibdib mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang, duyang ka ng magiting, sa manlulupig, di ka pa sisil, sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong bughaw. May dilagang tula, tawid sa paglayang minamahal, ang kislap ng wataw at mo'y tagumpay na nagniningning, ang bituin at araw niya kailan pa may di magdidilim. Lupa ng araw ng luwal, hatid pagsinta, buhay ay langit sa piling mo. Aming ligaya na pag may mga api ang mamatay ng dahil sa iyo. You may now take your seats. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry for that impromptu national anthem I rendered. Uh, there was a technical difficulty, so Professor Sol Lumba said, Aris, take charge. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Aris Carino. I'll be your master of ceremonies um, this morning. Um, a few words before we start. I know we're running late, but I'll make this very fast. It's always good coming back uh, here, home, uh, to the College of Law. Uh, this morning was bittersweet for me. It's sweet because I saw a batchmate, Suzette. Suzette, she's there. Uh, I was so happy seeing her, but when I introduced myself, she could hardly remember me. <laughs> because when we were classmates back in uh, 92 to 96, uh, I had a full crop of hair and uh, 60 pounds lighter. Uh, during uh, a few minutes before we started, I approached the group there. Uh, they looked like law students here. Um, I know, you, you'll be pretending to listen because they have notes and they're reading someone else's uh, course, Professor Jay. I learned they are your students and I informed them that there will be recitation. Uh, are you okay in answer? No, uh, just relax. Uh, this is uh, a lecture on the Philippine security interest in Panatag Show, sponsored by the UP Vanguard Center for Strategic Studies and the Phil... Um, I'm sorry about that and the Hans Keschler Political and Philosophical Society. Before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our distinguished guests here. And let me start with the representatives from the Office of the President, representatives from the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and National Defense, the Senate Committee on National Defense, representatives from the National Security Council and the Department of National Defense. Of course, uh, a person we all love. Uh, I was here in the uh, 80s and 90s, and this person was uh, one of my idols. I was a member, uh, I, I, I enrolled, and I was a member and habitué of the Third World Studies Center, sir. Uh, it's an honor to have you, uh, former UP President Francisco Dodong Nemenzo. We'd like to, of course, recognize uh, the Chairman of the Board of the UP Vanguard Inc. Board of Governors. Attorney G.B. Reyes. <laughs> National Commander, Vanguard Melito Salazar. <laughs> and the President of the Hans Keschler Political and Philosophical Society, President Lieutenant General Jaime S. De Los Santos, retired. We also are honored by the presence of the former presidents of the Hans Keschler Political and Philosophical Society, Attorney Remedios Balbin. Of course, members of the Hans Keschler Political and Philosophical Society are also here. Fellow UP alumni, Brads, 
and UP students, welcome to this morning's lecture. We begin by having our welcome remarks to be given by Attorney Gilbert Raymond T. Reyes, Chairman of the Board, UP Vanguard, Inc. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for taking time out uh, to uh, dissect and consider uh, an issue which has captured the imagination of a lot of Filipinos over the past few months. Uh, a, lot of, a lot is based on misinformation, a lot is based on genuinely thought out uh, information about what's really happening. So uh, we decided that maybe we should start listening to experts, actually find out the basis of the claims that are being put forward in the public, the positions that have been publicly taken by governments, and more importantly, how it impacts on us ordinary citizens. We wanted to look into the area of security because we, it's, not been, it's not been discussed too much except to say that the Philippines cannot defend itself from such a big power such as China. Well, I don't know exactly what that, that means, but there should be enough in, in the resources of the Filipinos to be able to do something about it. There's so much more that we can do than our government is willing to say publicly. But what we have to do here, of course, is to analyze exactly where we are. So what, what are the options available to the, to the protagonists in this uh, controversy? And it would be uh, time, it, it's really timely that we look into it more deeply from a legal as well as sociological standpoint. Uh, with this, I suppose uh, it is fitting only that we invite experts who have studied this matter rather extensively to share with us their thoughts and their views and for us to be able to participate at some point with our own questions, with our own perceptions on how the security considerations will impact our, us as individuals and our, our society as Filipinos. So without uh, much more, we would like to welcome you and uh, allow, allow us to uh, share with you the thoughts about the Panatag Show. Thank you very much, Attorney Gilbert Reyes. Attorney Gilbert Reyes is correct that, uh, in saying that uh, we have experts uh, to speak in front of us today in the, for, uh, in the person of our uh, lecturer and reactors. I first met our lecturer uh, today uh, in law school. Uh, he was busy, uh, I think, finishing his courses. And uh, uh, I, I think he started to teach also while, uh, while I was here. Uh, but uh, I was privileged to be invited by him and his group the, by, uh, of the UP Law, Law Center International uh, Studies. What is that group, saw? Yeah, that's it. Um, when we had uh, um, a lecture also by Professor Jay, on the regulatory and permitting framework for the upstream oil and gas industry. Professor Batung Bakal presently teaches property and obligations and contracts in addition to law of the sea and natural resources. A graduate of the UP College of Law, Professor Batung Bakal holds degrees of Master of Marine Management and Doctor in the Science of Law, both from Dalhousie University in Canada. His graduate degrees were acquired under scholarship grants from the Canadian International Development Agency and the prestigious Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, respectively. Taking advantage of his graduate training in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary studies, his career spans very diverse fields of marine policy research. These have included marine territorial and jurisdictional issues, international maritime boundary negotiations, high seas fisheries, seafaring, shipping, marine environmental protection, coastal resource management, maritime security, and archipelagic studies. His doctoral research examined the relationship between ocean energy development and its effects on adjacent coastal communities from the viewpoint of ecological social justice, combining research techniques and methodologies from the social and applied sciences. Currently, Professor Batong Bakal is an active member of the technical team that prepared and will soon defend the Philippines' claim to a continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles in the Benham Rice region, made in a submission filed 
with the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, pursuant to the provisions of Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor to present to you our lecturer for today, Professor J. L. Batumbakal. Thank you, Aris, for the introduction. Uh, just an update with respect to the Benham Rice uh, claim, it has already been approved. everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak on this uh, really hot and burning issue. It has uh, occupied the front pages of the national dailies and has been a frequent uh, item of uh, television and, and other uh, news uh, programs. Now, in an era of uh, sound bites and visual cues and very short attention spans, that is practically an eternity. And it has uh, allowed the territorial issues for the first time to really sink into the national consciousness. Okay. Um, but this, um, well, it has become a truly popular issue, but this popularization of this uh, issue has also come at a great price. A very visible disarray and lack of restraint in circ and circumspection in public discussion of issues and, uh, and problems that really are much better dealt with quietly and behind closed doors. This has really not been helped at all by the overt sensationalism of uh, the mass media, which has, in typical fashion, mixed every possible video clip, sound bite, uh, off the cuff, cuff comment for maximum emotional effect. Likewise, there's also a tendency, uh, there has been a tendency of many people, both in and out of government, to uh, speak their mind too quickly and too loudly without requisite reflection on the confusion that may be uh, caused by this. This is also compounded by uh, the marked attitude on the part of some who think that they are the only ones who have the correct view and refuse to consider alternative perspectives on an issue such as the national uh, territory, the territorial integrity, and national sovereignty. This. Um, these um, shortcomings can be a recipe for complete disaster. So, well, allow me first to preface my, dis my discussion with Falum Caviar, and I found it necessary to do so uh, precisely because of what has been going on uh, with uh, statements being uh, uh, distributed in the media. I speak here in my personal capacity as a member of the academia and no one else, not even the, this very college. You know? My position is by no means to be interpreted as being shared by others in this institution, which is a public institution, nor should it be considered as being an official government position, despite my being a public officer and employee as a professor in this uh, college. Okay. Now, it is absolutely necessary for us to have a very clear understanding of where we stand with respect to Bajo de Masinlok, or Panatag Shoal, as it is more popularly known. Part of the problem really has been uh, the tendency to confuse Baha de Masinlok, its issues, its characteristics, the possible resources there, everything about it, to confuse it with the Kalayan Island group, when in truth, these are actually completely, totally different. Okay? Even with respect to the basis for our sovereignty and jurisdiction, it is completely different. So in, that means really that our approaches to the discussion and our approaches to addressing the issues should also be, similar, uh, should also be very different. Bao de Masinlok is a lone coral atoll, approximately 260 nautical miles northeast of the Kalayan Island Group. It's that far, it's that far removed, about 104 miles west of Luzon. There are three rocks above water at high tide, and these can qualify as rocks under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, Article 121. That is precisely what is provided for in the New Baselines Law. 
As a wrap, they can generate a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, but not an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles. It has been known by, very many, by many names. The Philippine Navy operationally refers to it as Panatag Shoal. Uh, its international name in international charts published by the Nambria, as well as by the UK Hydrographic Office as well as, and other uh, hydrographic offices, call it Scarborough Reef or Shoal. While scientific papers refer to it as the Scarborough Sea Mount. This, Scar this name Scarborough really was uh, derived from the name of a British ship, the HMS Scarborough, which was wrecked there sometime around, uh, sometime before the 1800s, when the British conducted the very first systematic and accurate charting of the site of the South China Sea. In the Philippines, its official legal name is Bajo de Masinloc, which literally translates into low-lying part of Masinloc and not under Masinloc, not below Masinloc, not lower Masinloc, as has been erroneously stated by various quarters. As Bajo de Masinloc in nautical terms that specifically refers to a reef or show which is just, uh, just underwater but visible. Okay. It received this designation, the original designation was actually <coughs> Bajo de Masinlogo. Uh, this designation was made by Spanish mariners and, and cartographers in the early 1700s. To describe it as a low-lying part or reef of Masinloc is really an attribution of identity with the coastline of Masinloc. Previously, it was designated by the Spaniards uh, initially as Panacot, which together with uh, Galit to the north and Lumbay to the south, comprised one of three oceanic reefs marked as navigational hazards for the galleons sailing into or from, the Man from Manila and the Visayas. It is possible though, so this is the map, the famous Murillo Velarde map, the first complete map of the archipelago. And you see there on the left hand side, wait, here, these are the three reefs I'm referring to. This is Bajo de Masinloc or Panacot. This is Bajo de Bolinao or Galit. And this is Bajo de Mirabella or Lumbay. Those were the, the hazards to navigation for the galleons at the time. However, it is entirely possible that all three actually refer to the very same feature because it was not until the invention and widespread use of the ship-based chronometer in the 1790s that uh, mariners were really, uh, were really able to accurately locate features in the water. So they were, prior to that, they were prone to making mistakes in reporting the location of these features. After all, all they had to go on was a compass direction and dead reckoning. Now, the existence of only Panacot Shoal and not uh, the other two reefs was confirmed by the Spanish Malaspina expedition in 1792 to, 19, uh, to 1793. Now, this, by the way, is oh, yeah, that is an enlargement of that particular region, and you see the three reefs very clearly. Bao de Masinloc should be considered as having been ceded to the United States by Spain not through the Treaty of Paris of 1898, which through these famous Treaty of Paris lines that uh, Chinese Vice Minister Fu Ying capitalizes on, but through the Treaty of Washington of 1900. The Treaty of Washington clarified in its sole article that all islands under Spanish title or claim of title at the time of the Treaty of Paris, even if they were outside of the Treaty of Paris lines, were considered as having been ceded as if they were inside the lines. Bajo de Masinloc is thus very prominent in the first official American map of the Philippine Islands, which you see here, issued in 1900 by the U.S. Bureau of Coast and Geodetic Surveys and based on the work of Father Jose Algue, S.J., and Filipino draftsmen of the Manila Observatory. And you see Bajo de Masinloc very prominently shaded to the left. Now, the other thing about this is that one, oh, I just recently found out that one of the criticisms against using this map, and this is criticism by Taiwan, is that it includes uh, islands of Borneo as well as the southern tip of Taiwan. Okay? But notice the very clear difference in coloring. Now, now since that time, therefore, Bao de Masinloc has been constantly under the direct administration and control of the Philippine government primarily for the purposes of safety of navigation. It was, after all, a very well-known shipwreck site. 
even up to now, if you look at chart 4200 of Dinamria, there are three shipwrecks that are clearly marked there. Um, the responsibility for surveillance of the reef and ensuring that it was well marked as a navigational hazard was placed squarely on the Philippines at the time under the United States. All relevant nautical charts of the Philippines exhibit the discharge of that duty. All international sailing directions published by other countries, such as Britain, from the, from the 1800s onwards, also included Scarborough Reef or Shoal prominently as part of the Philippine coast. And its status as a hazard to navigation never really changed. It has featured prominently in several more shipwrecks due to bad weather in the early days of shipping. Even the Supreme Court of the Philippines in 1916 bears witness to the fact that the responsibility for incidents on the shoal lay exclusively with the Philippines. It is a background fact in the incorporation of Anglo-American rules on salvage into our maritime law jurisprudence. As late as last year, again, and also as late as last year, the Philippine Coast Guard even rescued fishermen stranded by a, by a typhoon at that shoal. Such a rescue by Philippine-based marine agencies is merely the latest in a very long record stretching back about 100 years or more. And occasionally, the wrecks on the shoal, as well as the ruins of the former lighthouse, okay, which was destroyed by typhoon, uh, that lighthouse was put up by, the, by us as well, these are used for target practice by the Philippine and U.S. military, which issued and publicized appropriate international notices in accordance with standard international practice. And all throughout these years, the place has been a fishing ground of the small and mid to medium scale commercial fishermen of Zambales, who refer to it by its colloquial name, Carburo. Thus, there can be no, there can be no question at all that Bajo de Mesilok was within the functional jurisdiction of the Philippines during colonial times, and was already part of it at its birth as an independent nation state. The exercise of administration and jurisdiction over the area, the conduct of government activities, are equivalent to occupation that was open, peaceful, public, and un uninterrupted at least until 1997. It was only in 1997 that China began openly and publicly questioning Philippine sovereignty and jurisdiction over the area by taking the advantage of the actions of a small band of amateur radio operators comprised of international members, who attempted to install a radio station there. Note that China could not have possibly exercised jurisdiction over Wang Yan Island, as it calls it, prior to 1983. Because Wang Yan Island never even officially existed according to the Chinese records until that year. And despite having designated it as such, China did not actually take any overt action to pursue its claim until nearly a decade and a half later, in 1997. Now, oops, these are the other exercises of uh, sovereignty and jurisdiction that we were undertaking. Okay. Now, let us now, it bears repetition that China, even the Chinese, admit that the name Wang Yan Island never existed until 1983. So we should really consider more, in more detail the more prominent basis of their claim. On 17 April 2012, the Embassy of the People's Republic of China published its explanation in the local papers for the benefit of the Philippine public. The Department of Foreign Affairs responded to this with its own position paper on 26 April. And then on 10 May, the China Daily News, Daily News, widely seen to be the propaganda arm of the Communist Party of China, stated the grounds for, the Ch for China's claim to what it calls Huang Yan Island. And if you look at this in isolation, on their face, indeed, maybe, the primers attempt to cast doubt on the Philippine position. Now, in sum, the China argues that it first discovered the island, gave it its name, and incorporated it into its territory, and always exercised jurisdiction over it. However, a serious examination of the Chinese position clearly bears out severe internal inconsistencies in its declared reasoning, which caused them to backfire. Take its strongest insistence that China was the first to discover and name Wang Yan Island in the Yuan Dynasty and incorporate it into China. The Yuan Dynasty was established by Kublai Khan in the 13th century. China at the time was only part of the Great Mongol Empire. <laughs> Going by the implied logic of acquisition by the sovereign of the time, then by China's argument, Wang Yan Island should therefore rightly belong to Mongolia. Let's talk with Mr. Shuli Nala. 
but let us take a step back. Take the other argument. Consider this claim of discovery during the Yuan Dynasty against historical fact, which is also supplied by Chinese records. Chinese chronicles clearly state that as early as from the 7th to 10th century, Philippine inhabitants had established contacts with China under the Tang Dynasty, and that is 700 years prior to the Yuan. The Chinese of the time knew very well that the islands of the Philippines were inhabited by coastal seafaring peoples. In fact, their records, like the Chufan Chi, speak clearly in fear of the frequent slave trading expeditions of the Visayans reaching China's Fujian coast. The Visayans were the masters of the Southeast Asian seas, and the seafaring raiders were feared across the region. The same Chinese records also speak of the lucrative trade in metals, weapons, musical instruments, gold jewelry from as far south as Butuan, the premier port polity of the time. It was precisely because of the profitability of this trade that the Chinese traders during the Yuan dynasty asked their government, finally, to send official trade missions to Southeast Asia. Thus, even if ever the Yuan dynasty mariners came to the Philippines or any of its parts, it was because they wanted to meet the Filipinos' ancestors who were already there. These were not journeys of discovery of hidden places, but purposeful voyages to trade with pre-existing lands and peoples. Consider also that Yuan, uh, Wang Yan Island could not have possibly been on any map of the Yuan Dynasty, or any other ancient Chinese map for that matter. Perusal of two extant maps, one made during the Yuan period itself, and a later one based on Yuan maps, do not even properly show and locate our largest islands of Luzon and Mindanao, much less a small rock, larger than a, uh, no larger than a conference table at high tide. This is the Yuan dynasty map. Can't even find Mindanao, which is the second largest island of the country. This is the later map, which is based on Yuan on previous Yuan maps. This was uh, about 100, yeah, 100 years later, 1402. Nasa mga bang Pilipinas? I mean, you can see the coast of Vietnam, you can see the Gulf of Tonkin, you can see the, uh, what you call that, the peninsula that juts out to Hainan Island. Try finding Wang Yan Island there. Okay. Now, further, according to the China Daily, it actually first appeared on Chinese maps, the name, uh, uh, no, sorry, the feature first appeared on Chinese maps in January 1935 as one of the features officially listed by the government's water mapping committee. And according to this 1935 listing, the name officially given by the committee was Scarborough Shoal. <laughs> Isn't it odd, therefore, that the very first official Chinese name for a place they discovered would be the English name? This is stark evidence that the, mark, that the water mapping committee itself only found out about the shoal from British Admiralty charts. The point of fact is that Baho de Masinlok did not receive any distinctly Chinese designation until more than 10 years later in 1947, at which time they called it Minzu Reef, Democracy Reef, and listed it as part of the Spratlys Island, 260 miles away. It is difficult to conceive of Chinese exercise of jurisdiction and apparently did not even know how the location of, this, of its exercise. Clearly also, the Chinese did not consider it an island at all, not until nearly 40 years later in 1983 when they began calling it Wang Yan Island. This obviously indicates that it was only around that time that the Chinese actually reached the place and realized it could qualify as an island. More detailed research into China's claims similarly uh, reveal, to a far greater extent, the inherent weaknesses and internal inconsistencies in China's basis for claiming Bajo de Masin law. But I'll not go into that anymore. I mean, you already see the tip of the iceberg. Yet it seems that less time has been spent on bringing these weaknesses to a bewildering light for the Filipino people, and instead more time has been devoted to openly discussing the very details or the Philippine legal position, threatening litigation, invoking the mutual difference treaty with the United States, and whatnot. In a way, we have been provoked into unnecessarily stating legal positions without adequately checking the facts and smooth, smoothing out the fear of the case. And for me, that really is a no-no. Now, 
Let us turn to the basic question. Why do we seek to protect Baudimus in law from Chinese incursion? The common response would likely be along the lines of a very, very simple reason. We do not wish any part of the Philippines to be taken by China, as it did with mischief back in 1995 and 1999. The concern is especially heightened because of various incidents last year in the West Philippine Sea, especially on Recto Bank. Such a response is undoubtedly based on the underlying premise that in order to maintain our territorial integrity, we must prevent any and all intrusion, whether by the Chinese or other foreigners, into any part of our territory. Territorial integrity is tied up intimately with national sovereignty, such that one cannot undermine the first without causing damage to the other. But if we define it that way, then a military response represents the appropriate course of action against any would-be intruder. Territorial integrity implies an absolute indivisible condition. The fracturing of territory is nothing less than an assault on the very existence of the state, for which it is entitled to the ultimate recourse of self-defense with the use of force. Why then do we hesitate to defend Baha'u law? Okay. Well, cynics and skeptics would immediately answer that it's because we are militarily weak. In other words, we lack the capability and resources to protect and maintain our territorial integrity militarily. But then this begs the question, why then will you have a national, do you have a national interest in something that you cannot attain? In this light, territorial integrity, although it may be part of the answer, by itself is inadequate to determine the actions and activities of the Philippines in Bahadimus in law. Defending the territorial integrity of the, of the archipelago, or any of its components, implies a military response, which admittedly will not lead to a favorable outcome. It is therefore important to look at Bahadimus in law not as a simple matter of defending territory. There has to be much more than that. The facets of the national interest must be clearly defined and framed in other ways in order to enable us to generate other more appropriate responses. And the availability of the options, the avoidance of single solutions is really vital, especially in cases of maritime disputes and foreign relations where words and actions must be, must be carefully nuanced and calibrated. The alternative frames are defined by the nature of the incursions themselves. For the, from the reports, the incident began with the sighting of Chinese illegal fishermen within the shoal, taking out coral, sharks, endangered species like marine turtles and clams. When the Navy was sent to undertake, uh, what the Navy did was to undertake basic law enforcement operations, arrest foreign poachers for these illegal activities. Marine environmental con uh, conservation and protection in this light is a very key concern of the Philippines. It is a as a matter of fact, it has been something of a world, the Philippines has been something of a world leader in conservation of marine resources, especially at the local levels. It has participated in leading edge research into coral ecosystems and has been a premier learning site, both here and abroad, for coral management. It pioneered the conservation of giant clams, introducing culture, breeding, and repopulation techniques. Its extensive national and international fishing interests, in case you didn't know, the, the Philippines is a, fishery, is a fishing power, have also resulted in much awareness about the dangers of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, for which it has earned a certain zeal in protecting marine resources. The Philippines actually learned the importance of endangered species the hard way. And these resources were very close to depletion on account of hundreds of years of exploitation, but fortunately, in recent years, it has taken action to try to maintain and rehabilitate at least some of those that remain. This cast Bajo de Masinloc as an environmental security issue rather than a territorial issue, and the protection of the shoal from environmental destruction as the primary justification for our activities there. One feature of environmental issues is that they are not bound by any political boundaries, and they cross national and regional lines and establish interests in common with other states. Environmental issues transcend sovereign borders, and therefore are more likely to encourage cooperation and support from a wider range of stakeholders. Unlike if you frame it purely as an issue of territorial integrity, in which case, you're basically left to fend for yourself. Closer consideration about the Masin as a marine resource also points to its importance as, an, as a contributor to the country's marine ecosystem, which has historically provided much of its protein requirements, i.e. its food. From satellite observations of chlorophyll distribution on plankton, the foundation of the marine food chain, it is clear Bajo de Masinloc is a veritable oasis of life in a desert of deep ocean. Okay. 
ocean circulation within the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea, prompted by monsoon seasons, transports marine life into and out of Bajo de Masinloc, either providing its surrounding areas in the Philippine EEZ with the basic sustenance of fish and encouraging their migration uh, or encouraging their migration and propagation along Philippine, the Philippine western coast and across the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea as well. At certain times of the year, plumes of chlorophyll reach out from the inter-island waters and cross into Bajo de Masinloc. If this one, you can see it here. A little bit faint. This indicates that the shoal really acts as a shelter for migrating reef fish that breed and live in our archipelagic waters. Such a bountiful shelter is so far offshore, enables such fish to travel far, grow and reproduce, which is necessary for such a resource to continue to thrive and supply our needs. Food security should therefore be included in the lenses with which we regard this shoal. I'll just show you a few more uh, um, slides. This is in January, when the currents Oh, sorry, where the winds are, are, uh, are coming from the north, blowing, blowing a bit southward. And you can see that the chlorophyll is being blown on the surface towards the Philippines. And anything that is produced here is basically being carried by the current downward. This is in the pattern in April. You see how bright Scarborough Shoal is. And there is still that plume. Well, I see it very clearly on my screen, but probably this one is not so. This is in August when the winds change direction. Well, when the winds are of a different direction, and you see, actually, you can see the plume pointing towards the north here. And this is in December. Now, newspapers and netizens have referred to Bao de Masinloc as being a potential site for offshore oil and gas. However, this is an error arising from the confusion of Bao de Masinloc with the Kalan Island Group. Current data available on offshore petroleum prospects in the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea do not indicate much petroleum potential in the vicinity of Scarborough Shoal. The geology of the area is simply not right for petroleum reserves. Right. Here, this is the map. That purple area is basically a, an unlikely, very unlikely, it indicates that it is very unlikely that you will find any petroleum in that area. Oh wait, just back up a little bit, sorry. The question of incursions by the Chinese should be considered as alternatives to the question of occupation. These are different situations. These are qualitatively different sets of problems. Whereas incursions imply a mere temporary or occasional presence for specific purposes, occupation means a permanent presence for multiple purposes. No doubt, Bao de Masinloc's geographical position is strategic vis-a-vis -vis Manila and Subic. From this position, it is possible to conduct short and medium range surveillance of marine and air traffic into and out of the country's two largest port areas. Um, it is also in the middle of it is in the middle of two busy sea lanes, as well as underneath major air travel routes between mainland Asia and Manila. I'll just show you the maps. Oh, sorry. This is, these are the sea lanes, and you see there Baha de Masinloc being very clearly indicated between two of the major sea lanes. That rectangle is the Kalan Island Group, the dangerous grounds. While these are the air routes. This shows the air routes. Um, and Baha de Masinloc, or it's obscured because it's because it's here underneath some of the major routes. Okay. Now, militarily, however, most like most of the islands in the South China Sea, the value of these places in wartime is nominal. I mean, they're basically small stationary targets in open water. They're easy to destroy. Their value, however, in peacetime is great. Similar to Mischief Reef, a permanent installation of Bahadur de Masin Lok represents long-range uh, long shelters and staging areas for all manner of marine activities, both military and civilian, which extends the, China, the, the reach of China's fleet well into the archipelago and beyond. Military analysts would see the occupation of the shoal as part of a network of offshore 
multipurpose installations with which China could effectively blanket the entire South China Sea and all maritime traffic within it. Any movement in this direction, however, will certainly cause jitters among military and commercial maritime powers because of the threat to freedom of navigation that they re that may represent. This is therefore another interest that could be shared, however, in common by the Philippines with other coastal states, not just its military ally, the United States, but all other ocean users. Comparison of the four immediately brings up some interesting contrasts vis vis the Philippines' Philippine, uh, previously avowed policy of multilateral engagement in the South China Sea, assuming that this is still its intent. If presented on the basis of preservation of pure territorial integrity, the Philippines ultimately shares no interest with any other state. Real politics dis dictates that no other coastal state will suffer any ill effects, whether Bao Di Masinlok is Chinese or Filipino, as long as the interests of freedom of navigation are preserved. But if cast as an issue of deliberate in the environmental de degradation or illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or as a potential threat to freedom of navigation, then the possibility of multilateral interests unfold. To be sure, it's not just a matter of, imagin of imaginative spin doctoring. It actually requires much more in terms of hard evidence as well as entirely different approaches to communication with China and with the rest of the region and the world. The mere existence of these interests <coughs> does not immediately translate into cooperation with other parties. You already see what happened at the ASEAN, recent ASEAN meeting. The exercise, but this exercise of comparing these interests demonstrates the value of being clear on what interests are sought to be protected and how they are being pursued as well as when. One wonders whether the standoff would have lasted this long had from the very beginning the incident, the incident been properly addressed and portrayed as a state-sponsored frustration of efforts to protect endangered species instead of a territorial contest or any other kind of portrayal. As I said, well, this is really a matter of diplomacy. Diplomacy is not just an art of language, it is also an art of presentation. No. So, let us look forward. At this point, it's too late for any recriminations on what has already happened, but we are, we are faced with a fluid and dynamic situation. We can only hope that this discussion does not end up as a post-mortem to a fait accompli. There are only five possible scenarios at this point. One, Bahadi Masinlok is unoccupied by any, either Chinese or Philippine. But this means a return to the status quo and there will be potential, potential for a repetition of frictions in the future. Second, op second possible scenario, there will now be regular continuous Chinese presence on the show in the form of their boats, their vessels. Other option, the one which we, are, we really do not like, is a permanent Chinese facility, similar to what happened with Mr. Free. Of course, the alternative could be a permanent Philippine facility, if the Chinese give us the chance and if the Philippine government decides to do so. But in either case, that would be a major change in the status quo in the South, in the South China Sea, and that could create many more problems as well. And the last option would be a formal modus vivendi by express agreement between the states on how to behave with respect to any activities conducted by either of them around the shore. Each of these scenarios need to be studied carefully and there will probably be variations in features as well as key decision points for each. But we may be able to discern a few general options for all. First, first of all, the legal option, which has been given much prominence in recent months. It has been announced that the Philippines intends to take China before an international tribunal over, a matter, over the matter of Bajo de Masinlok, even without China's consent. Some think this is possible, uh, and that it is the only recourse of the Philippines. In my own assessment, however, it is highly unlikely that any court, whether ITLOS or the ICJ, would ever take cognizance of such a case. From the DFA's published position paper and public statements, and the view of some of the academe, Philippines may unilaterally take China to court by sidestepping the fundamental need to address the issue of sovereignty over the shoal and pursue it merely as an issue of enforcement of sovereign rights in the EEZ. It also gives the impression that such a case will basically be a question of interpretation of UNCLOS provisions, such as whether the shoal qualifies as an island or whether or not the Philippine EEZ rights are being violated. With all due respect, however, any attempt to pursue such a case in those terms would be ill-advised. Even assuming that China disregards its own reservations to the UNCLOS dispute settlement mechanisms, 
it is not possible to, avo to avoid the issue of sovereignty over the shoal. It has been squarely put forward by China. Both parties admit, at the very least, to have that the shoal has rocks always above water at high tide. And therefore, they are entitled at least to a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles. This creates a territorial zone nearly as large as Manila Bay and Lingayen Gulf. From all accounts, whether Chinese or Filipino, the question activities have always been taking place in the very center of this territorial zone, right inside the shoal's perimeter. Unless the so issue of sovereignty over the rocks is resolved, therefore, it would be pointless to discuss EEZ rights, which in law must exist always outside of the territorial sea. To insist on pursuing a case like this for violation of EEZ rights, where the activities are completely within territorial waters, is like a, is like a, is a situation like a person, uh, like su it is like suing a person for trespassing into your backyard after you found him in flagrante delicto stealing the appliances of your house. Refusal by the Philippines to directly address the issue of sovereignty over the shoal would allow China, in that instance, the opportunity to prove its sovereignty claims and possibly win the case by default. Moreover, now, this is, this is the map, by the way. This is Venom Rice. That's ours. Um, okay, that is Scarborough Shoal, and you see there a 12 nautical mile circle. Actually, it should be larger because there are three rocks. But you can already see how big it is compared to Lingayen Gulf here and, and Manila Bay. Okay. Now, similarly, to, to put the question of whether or not these rocks generate an EEZ before an international court is a totally unnecessary gambit. At present, the Philippine position, as defined by RA9522 and based on the current maps of the Philippine EEZ, is that the shoal does not generate its own EEZ. That's why it's like that. That's why the blue line is very close to Scarborough Shoal. This effectively enclaves the shoal in an isolated territorial zone surrounded by the EEZ measured from Luzon. China will find it difficult to contest this position because it has taken a similar one with respect to its disputes against Japan. It officially insists that a mere rock cannot generate an EEZ, and this is with respect to the case of Okinotori Shima in the Pacific Ocean. I think I have a photo of that. Here. You can see it's very similar to Scarborough Shoal. Why then? If that is the case, that they, even China admits that this cannot generate an EEZ, why then should the Philippines make its position, this position, subject to the decision of an international tribunal, which is totally out of its control, which might find basis to rule otherwise? It is as if the Philippines is giving the Chinese side a 50% chance of expanding their jurisdictional claim, this time to an EEZ projected from the shoal on the basis of a judgment of a third party, where the Philippines may indeed ultimately need, so you see here, where the Philippines may indeed ultimately need to resort to international litigation in order to protect its rights in the West Philippine Sea, the current problem over Baha de Masilok is not the proper issue to begin that litigation with. Let's just go back here. Okay. A 200 mile EEZ around the shoal would push the Philippine EEZ between right here to deprive the EEZ of this area here. Okay. Now, that's a legal option. The second option is a bilateral option, a negotiated settlement. However, based on previous statements and positions, it appears that the Philippines a priori gives up on this option and resigns itself to the fact that it is the weaker party compared to China. The problem with this fatalist position is that it does not appear to adequately consider what is the national interest and what is the objective to be pursued. If the idea is that of a bilateral negotiation is to finally settle the sovereignty of the shoal, then it is probably true that engaging negotiations would be pointless because neither side will be, will be willing to give up its position. Such an analysis is borne out of a simplistic consideration, however, that negotiation is a zero-sum game. It is a process of haggling and persuading the other person of one's own position completely. And it also assumes that there is only one single issue, sovereignty over territory, only one interest in question, sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
both sides, however, have invested too heavily on their positions to back down. But what if the negotiation objective is not to settle sovereignty, but something else? For example, to prevent occupation, or to prevent environmental degradation, or to avoid civil incidents at least in the future. Scores of specialist institutions and hundreds of trained negotiators worldwide have long surpassed the conceptual obstacle represented by an, by an unequal bargaining position and determined that regardless of the odds, there are still many ways and means of achieving compromise and solving what were thought to be insurmountable problems. The resignation to weakness does not consider, as well, many lessons of history where David actually did slay Goliath. Take a look at Vietnam, vis-a-vis -vis the United States in the Vietnam War. Just because one is militarily or economically weak does not mean that one cannot be victorious. However, the fundamental requirement for winning in an asymmetric negotiation situation really is a clear definition and understanding of one's own interests, a formidable determination and political will, a proper framing of the problem, and a well-designed strategy with very clear objectives. Each incident presents its own specific sets of problems and solutions, and Bao de Musilok is no different. Now, obviously, this requires a lot of investment in capacity building, purposeful preparation, and sound strategy, something really that this country sorely needs, especially in all of its international negotiations, not just this one. The third option, the one that is being pursued, is multilateral engagement. Actually, this is probably the more difficult one in execution than even the bilateral option. The weekend's news about the failure of ASEAN to issue a joint statement is stark proof of the difficulty of this option. Long-time observers would not be surprised at that outcome. In addition to requiring the same building blocks as bilateral negotiations, effective multilateral engagement is actually much more complex because the Philippines must then be able to deal with multiple varied and oftentimes incongruent interests between multilateral partners. Multilateralism is not merely a task of persuading a large number to ally against one. It takes a long process of negotiating common interests with each and every one of them. It would be naive to expect that the Philippines can easily negotiate with ASEAN and other stakeholders into presenting a specific united front against the Chinese position. Despite certain commonalities, each country will essentially look out for its own national interests, and these will not necessarily coincide immediately and clearly with the Philippine position. Let me, talk, let me close this story with a, let me close this uh, lecture with a story and a simple observation. At the end of World War I, the French decided that the best way to defend themselves against another war with Germany was to extensively fortify and arm the border between them, which you see there, the red line. That was the Maginot Line, at least it know, as it is known. It was built, basically modern, it was the modern French version of the Great Wall of China. And everyone, civilian and military at the time, marveled at the structure and believed it to be an impregnable defense against the Germans. As it turned out, the Germans did not invade France by assaulting the Maginot Line. They, made, they, they first invaded the common neighbor Belgium, marched straight through the Ardennes Forest, and bypassed the Maginot Line. And within five days, France fell. This is one of the textbook examples of the phenomenon of groupthink when everyone is thinking and approaching a problem in exactly the same way, and no one thinks differently to determine if there are any flaws in their thinking. I believe that in many ways, the way in which the Philippines is dealing with this issue is an example, you know, is an example of this, and there is such a phenomenon at work right now. And it behooves us to think carefully and review critically what we have been doing and thinking with respect to this problem. This is the value of dissent and contradiction for as long as there is proper access, a proper process of assessment and synthesis, synthesis of what comes out of the conversation. What is important is that after the arguments, a clear course of action reveals itself. Now, second, I really do not believe that the Philippines should be as helpless as its officials portray it to be in public. When the president reportedly said that the AFP does not even have the capability to surveil Bahadur Masinlok, 
thus necessitating a possible request for a U.S. pipe plane overflight, I really could not believe that. The Air Force's FS, uh, SF-260 trainers have a range of over 2,000 kilometers, while the Navy's BN-2 Islander has a range of 1,400 kilometers. Either plane could make the short 250-kilometer hop to Baja de Masinloc quickly and back several times on a full tank of gas. Well, assuming we have a tank of gas. <laughs> All we need for reconnaissance with these planes is either a co is a co-pilot or a passenger trained in using an SLR camera with a camera with a good telephoto lens. Because really, all what all that we want to do is to find out what's going on in the shoal. There is no need for U.S. spy planes. We can carry out our own reconnaissance while, with existing equipment, however humble they may be. From this, one realizes really that there are probably many hidden resources, many hidden strengths that we have, and we are not as powerless as we think we are. Too long have we internalized the pessimistic idea of weakness, this self-defeating attitude of helplessness. It is high time that we break free of the shackles of this self-imposed and self-sustained ineffectiveness. We need to find it in ourselves to take action and figure our way out of this problem entirely on our own. Even you, even the ordinary person, when faced with bullying, you cannot expect others to be always the one to take the cudgels for you. One has to stand up for oneself. And it is long, it is past, uh, long past the time that in this issue, as well as many others, that we have done so. Thank you very much. Professor Jay, I'm Felicitation, as my French boss would say. Uh, very well done, sir. I suggest you copyright this because uh, a lot of us have our USB it's prepared to copy your presentation to share it with oh. others, especially the map, please sir. Don't. Very, 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 very well presented. Uh, please don't. I do not have permission. <laughs> uh, your laptop is here, so while speaking, I'll... Papa simply na lang ako. No, sir. Honestly, uh, we're very impressed. Um, I invite everyone to please look at your programs. Um, the next part of our programs will be uh, presentations and a few words from our reactors, and then after that will be an open forum. I invite everyone to uh, gather your thoughts and questions, uh, and we have microphone stands uh, in the aisle, middle aisle, uh, where you can ask your questions later. Okay? Our first reactor is Rear Admiral Vicente Mendoza Agdamag, Armed Forces of the Philippines, retired. He is the Deputy Director General of the National Security Council Secretariat. Rear Admiral Mendoza Agdamag is a graduate of two Master of Science degrees, Master of Science in Management at the Philippine Christian University and Master of Science in National Resource Strategy at the National Defense University, Washington, D.C., USA. Rear Admiral Lagdamag is the first Filipino to receive a writing award at the National Defense University for his research paper, Intelligence and the Japanese Invasion of the Philippines, and this was written in 2001. He is the author of four books, namely, 150 Days of Hell, Japanese Invasion of the Philippines, 08 December 1941, 06 May 1942. This does not mean, however, that uh, Rear Admiral Agdamag was already of age during that time. The second book is Alliance and Victory, World War II in the Philippines. Third book, Our Seas, Our Philippines, Experiences of a Naval Commanding Officer. And the fourth book is National Security Strategy, A Comprehensive Guide. Rear Admiral Agdamag's last assignment in the Philippine Navy was as Commander, Naval Education and Training Command, in San Antonio, Zambales. He is happily married to Marianne Kalubagib Agdamag. They have four children, namely Jan Vincent, Vicente Jr., Vicente Galileo, and Teresa. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our first reactor, Rear Admiral Vicente Mendoza Agdamag. Thank you very much, Aris, for that uh, very kind introduction. 
Uh, when uh, General Jimmy De Los Santos called me up uh, and asked me to be a reactor on this morning's uh, lecture, uh, readily, uh, because there, uh, all the time I'll be, I'll be in uh, Malcolm Hall, UP, uh, 30 minutes before the scheduled lecture. Well, uh, of course, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, forum. And uh, it's really, uh, really that I speak uh, uh, in front of uh, distinguished visitors. But uh, during my, uh, during our advocacy program of our national security policy, which was approved by the president last July 11, uh, 2011, I was going, we were going around, uh, our team from the National Security Council, uh, lecturing, disseminating our national security policy. And part of that are uh, schools and universities. So uh, I, had the, I had the opportunity of uh, giving a lecture on the Asian Center of UP, uh, La Salle, Ateneo, uh, San Beda, than other non-government organizations, and of course, our government agencies. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Uh, aside from uh, my interest of uh, coming up and giving you a, a reaction to, our, to a very favorite uh, topic of mine, because uh, I was a commanding officer in 1995 that went to Mischief Reef. And I wrote an article about that, and later on I'll share to you my experiences. But beside that, uh, also I went here because my father was a UP Vanguard. Uh. Uh. He was a product of uh, uh, of the UP, and as he was telling me, he was uh, he was trained under the UP Rifle and Pistol Club. As you know, my father uh, he retired 1977 as I entered the military service, uh, joined the Olympics. He was a representative of the Philippines. <coughs> Three Olympics, first in, uh, in Tokyo in 1960, 1960 uh, Rome 1960, Tokyo in 1964, and Mexico in 1968. So, talagang uh, mapagmamalaki ng UP ang father ko. Uh, beside that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, The two of us co-authored two books, as mentioned earlier, no? Uh, that's why may relation, may relation itong, ano, no? what I'm here right now, that we may be militarily weak, no? But we have the experience. Uh, our, our soldiers are professional, our officers are professional. Yun nga lang, we didn't learn our lesson. We didn't our, learn our lesson from World War II, no? Uh, that's why uh, I myself was uh, talagang uh, I'm doing my best to give a lecture oh, what are the lessons learned uh, the Philippines should learn about World War II in the Philippines. Because we can learn a lesson. You know? We can learn a lot of lessons our experiences in World War II. That's why we, I myself, uh, my father and, my, and myself authored, uh, we have two books, no? This one, a trilogy, uh, written by three, uh, three famous Filipinos. The first is 
General Vicente Lim, he was the commander of the 41st Division. Kung makita niyo yung pera niyo, nandun yung si General Vicente Lim dun sa 1,000 pesos. No? The other author was uh, General Achienza. He was uh, a former chief of staff of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. And the third are, was the book, uh, 150 Days of Hell, uh, Japanese Invasion of the, the Philippines from 8 December uh, 1941 to 6 May during the, uh, the surrender of uh, Corregidor, 1942. And the other book uh, we co-authored is uh, Alliance and Victory. It's a sequel of the first book. It starts with the Battle of uh, Lingayen Gulf, uh, uh, Leyte Gulf, I mean, and ends up to the surrender of General Yamashita, August of 1945. So it's the total uh, term from the Japanese invasion of the Philippines to the end of the war in August of 1945. And later at the end of this program, I'll be donating the books to the UP Library, UP Vanguard Library. Uh, let me congratulate Dr. J. Batumbakal for his wide-ranging perspectives of the Panatag Show issue. Uh, the Treaty of Washington of 1900 uh, as uh, elaborately explained by Dr. J. Batumbakal, gave us the basis of what all of us in the Philippine Navy, the officers and men of the Philippine Navy were asking for a very, very long time. That for us, uh, soldiers trained as professional soldiers, we just follow orders. No, we, we don't question what the orders are, we just follow orders. For us, we just follow operational orders coming from higher headquarters. That's our training. But as a commanding officer, as a commanding officer of BRP Iloilo, the first ship that went to Mischief Reap in 1995, and we submitted pictures of Mischief Reef. Later on, I'll give you some pictures of Mischief Reef when I visited the Mischief Reef. That was the basis of the uh, diplomatic protest during the time of uh, President Fidel V. Ramos. As a commanding officer, my concern was the accomplishment of the mission given to us, as well as the safety and welfare of my men. That's the primordial mission that I care. Secondly, the position of Dr. J. Batumbakal on Panatag Show is in line with our national security policy. Uh, in, case, in case you don't know, uh, our newly approved national security policy and probably later this uh, month, our national security strategy through the assessment of our national security policy uh, is available online. So uh, www.gov.ph, look for the Office of the President on historical notes and policies. So you can, you can uh, have that available online. So in summary, our, our national security policy states that the state shall undertake the necessary steps to ensure that the Filipino national community's welfare, well-being, ways of life, institutions, territorial integrity, and sovereignty are enhanced and protected. So from there, uh, Dr. J uh, mentioned about territorial integrity, and that's uh, a responsibility not only from the government agencies, but all, all of us, all Filipinos. 
And thirdly, Dr. Batumbakal's three options of legal, bilateral, and multilateral engagements are all worth knowing. Of course, uh, uh, I cannot detach myself from uh, the National Security Council, uh, uh, but because of uh, academic uh, discussion, academic freedom, uh, at the uh, National Security Council, we are using the five instruments of national power. The first is political instrument. The second is diplomatic and legal, as will affect this one, diplomatic and legal. The third is informational instrument. The fourth is economic instrument. And the fifth is military instrument. So we're using the five instruments of national power. Now at this point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you some slides. I'll, I'll show you some slides. Uh, as I share my experiences to you, uh, starting 1995 uh, uh, up to the present, uh, because of uh, so many studies on, uh, on China, so I became very much interested on, uh, on this very important topic. Before 1995, uh, there were only three Chinese structures. The Johnson Reef, this one. The Subi Reef, uh, which uh, prominently uh, came out when uh, the Chinese frigate 560 ran aground. And Ferry Cross Reef, because they installed recently a radar dome at Subi Reef. Next slide. So in 1995, when I went to Mischief Reef, that was in February of 1995, I, I just saw uh, a series of uh, steel structures. You know, something like this one. Uh, not yet complete, but I had the idea of medyo matagal na, no? The structure is old, and most probably it started about one or two years ago. Then, of course, uh, it became, earlier they said it's a fisherman's shelter. Now it became a, a, a fortress, a military fortress with uh, uh, radar domes, with helicopter pads, so forth and so on. Uh, there, ito, there were uh, uh, came out uh, some in some articles that in mischief reef they're planning to have a runway on this side. It's a three mile proposed runway to be established later on, siguro hindi pa uh, by the Chinese. You know? And to give you an idea how important uh, mischief reef is. Next. Next one. Then, uh, mo lang. Windows. Doon lang sa ano? No, no. Before that. Okay. This is our Kalayan Island group. No? Uh, bounded by these lines during the time of President Marcos' presidential decree, Talayan Island Claim. And if you notice, Mischief Reef is located right in the center of the Kalayan Island Group. 
We have nine islands, nine detachments in uh, KIG. The, the biggest is our Pag-asa detachment, this one. And less, uh, and smaller ones, the Parola detachment, this one. Likas, Panata, Kota, Patag, Tawak, Ayungin, and Rizal Reef. So these are the nine islands we have in Kalayan Island Group. Uh, the Chinese, uh, I mentioned the three, but they're expanding their detachments in Kalayan Island Group. And the most recent was uh, when the frigate was run aground, that run aground here at uh, Half Moon Shoal or Hasa Hasa. This is just about uh, about 60 nautical miles from Balabak Island. Napakalapit. No? Okay, next, next slide. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, just just to let you know, no, that uh, uh, on questions of sovereignty and territory, China is willing to use force. No? On examples of uh, from Tibet, from the Korean War, from Viet so forth and so on. So that's basically the these slides. Okay, let me. Uh, let me give you the uh, the nine dust line of China. No? Nine dust line. It starts with uh, here at Hainan, goes down to Natuna Island in Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, up to Taiwan, towards Aleutians in Alaska. So, but this one. Uh, Questionable ang ano no ang location because they just said, "Eto, these are the nine dust line." No, so the specific coordinates of this nine dust line are not given. No, wala walang ano basta gumuit lang sila o oh, eto sa amin to. It occupies 80 percent of South China Sea. Etong nine dust line. And uh, what's more. Uh, Uh, early this year, they mentioned that uh, they will start mapping uh, all the coordinates of this nine dust line. So up to now, uh, the mapping, the charting, the placing of markers on the different points on the nine dust line are not yet complete. So that's the reason nagkabul uh, sila dito sa apanatag show. Because from my experience in uh, the KIG, from the numerous patrols that I've done in the Kalayan Island Group or the Spratlys, they will place markers. They will place markers, uh, a diameter of one, one foot with Chinese markers. Then uh, upon placing that, they'll conduct hydrographic surveys. You know, hydrographic surveys are important so that during night time, pag meron kang mapa, you can enter easily even during night time. So that's the, that's the importance of having hydro, hydrographic surveys on all the points of this nine dust line. So when, uh, that's the reason why also they have a lot of fishermen, a lot of people going with them because when you conduct a hydrographic survey, it's uh, personnel intensive. Nandun, naglalagay kayo ng, ano, ng, uh, ng mga lines. You measure the depth. You measure uh, a line formation. So, very detailed ang paglagay sa mapa what the measurements of the fathoms of every island. So, that's how detailed. So, they need a lot of people. So, that's the reason why uh, some of the fishermen are going, uh, 30 fishing boats, you know, a lot of people inside. So that's the reason why there's a lot of people 
going in the different places along this nine dash line. Very uh, personnel intensive ang paggawa ng hydrographic survey. So they're doing that right now. Even, so at this time we have not entered uh, uh, Panatag Shoal uh, for so many weeks already. The last time was when we left the area 5 June. Umalis na tayo doon. My suspect is uh, there are already markers cemented on the rocks of Panatag Shoal. In, if you remember in 1997 when uh, it was much publicized visit of uh, Cong Congressman Ablan that went to uh, Panatag Shoal that, uh, and uh, put the flag uh, we were, that was the time when uh, Dr. J. Batum Bakal was saying that there was an amateur band that uh, put up some uh, uh, antenna farm, antenna, radio amateur, on that, uh, in, inside the shoal. Then afterwards, when we arrived, our uh, gunboat entered the, the, the shoal and uh, we removed, we demolished. Pinasabog namin lahat yung mga Chinese markers inside the Scarborough show. And that was in 1997. Then we built a, a fisherman shelter, uh, uh, Filipino style, inside the Scarborough show. Pero later on, sila naman ang nagpasabo. Sinira naman nila. So ganun ang, ganun ang laban dun sa Panatag show. Next. Okay, this is the Panatag show. Uh, you can see the rocks uh, out of the water. What's the importance of uh, Panatag show? As mentioned by Dr. J, uh, it's a navigational reference. No? Before it used to have a lighthouse, but uh, it's uh, not anymore there. Uh, then it connects from Mischief Reef the nine dash line connects the Scarborough Shoal from the Mischief Reef connects the Panatag Shoal up to Taiwan. Taiwan, as you know, is a core interest of China. So that's basically the nine dash line. And later on, I'll, I'll be showing you after the nine dash line is the first island chain. You know, uh, the Chinese, if you study Chinese, they're fond of, uh, part of their culture is uh, uh, mahilig magbakod, no? Just like the Great Wall of China. Great Wall of China. So that's, that's part of their culture, you know, if you, if you notice. So mahilig sila magbakod, and they start with this nine dash line. And uh, later on, it becomes a defensive line. So, mamiya pakita ko yung first island chain of uh, China. Then, it's a perimeter structure of markers. As I uh, mentioned earlier, before uh, you, st you, you build or construct a, a, a structure, they place markers uh, inside the island or on the island. So it becomes a perimeter of structure of markers. Then this is very important for all of us. Once they complete the nine dust line and have a first island chain, this is the reed bank. This is where our oil and gas deposits are located in the reed bank. So if they complete the nine dust line, pasok na pasok ang reed bank inside the nine dust line. Even here, yeah, Scarborough Show. Then of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they will be completing a hydrographic survey that trans a line from Paracels, dun sa Vietnam side, down to Natuna, down to the different countries of ASEAN, Mischief Reef, Scarborough Shoal, up to Taiwan. 
completion of the hydro hydrographic survey. And of course, charting of the first island chain. Next. In the end, before that. First island chain, no. Just a minute. Okay, this one, this is the first island chain. Uh, it's a geo, geo strategic positioning of China to keep away uh, countries because these are the coastal states that are supposed to be heavily guarded where the industrial sites of China are located. So they have to make a first island chain, this one, almost the same as the nine dash line. So ito yung parang kinopya lang nila yung nine dash line. But later on, no, and our estimate is in 10 years time, China will have, they have one aircraft carrier. In 10 years time, they have already three aircraft carriers. And they'll be willing to challenge already the United States. So this is the plan of China, the first island chain today, and later on the second island chain that runs from Japan to Guam down to the south. That's why when uh, Vice President Xi Jinping visited uh, United States last February, he mentioned Vice President, uh, she said, China and America had converging interests in the region. And there was ample space, ample space for both of us in the Pacific Ocean. So parang we're going back to the uh, Treaty of Tordesillas, di ba? The Portugal and Spain dividing the whole the globe between Portugal and and uh, and uh, Spain. So they want this. Uh, probably later on, we'll not see this uh, in the very near future, because they're very much interested in perfecting the first island chain. So later on, uh, the second island chain. Next, importance of, what's the importance of, okay, uh, I'm a student of uh, Mayhan, yung the naval strategies, and uh, what Mayhan says about uh, sea power, sea power is when you control the narrow seas, no? in global, uh, globally. So the Philippines has a very important position in Asia. When we were doing the national security policy, ano bang, what's the strategic importance of the Philippines? First, uh, we were called during the Spanish time, we were called the uh, Pearl of the Orient, you know, because of the presence of so many deep harbors in the Philippines, Manila Bay. Then when Japan invaded the Philippines, after Pearl Harbor, the next one was Philippines, because we were the strategic heartland of Asia. And according to Mehan, we occupy a central position in Asia. So that's important, geostrategic importance of the Philippines in terms of the world, in terms of East Asia. That's how important. About more than 60% of uh, world's cargo pass through the South China Sea. 
we have three important uh, narrow straits. These are the Luzon Strait up north, the San Bernardino Strait in the middle, and Surigao Strait down south. So if you notice, all shipping coming from the Pacific Ocean pass by in these three areas, narrow seas of the Philippines. And as they pass the Philippines, we have four, four, four important maritime routes. The first one is here, towards Indian Ocean and Africa and Europe. Manila, Sunda Strait, here. Then Singapore, San Francisco, Singapore Strait, San Francisco. Singapore, Shanghai, this one and Hong Kong, Saigon, going through uh, the Malacca Strait, Singapore Strait, towards Indian Ocean and Europe. So that's how important freedom of navigation for uh, the West Philippine Sea, and even the central position of the Philippines. Okay, let me now go to the the most important thing, why we want to defend and protect uh, Scarborough Shoal or Panatag Shoal. Because if they get incursion or occupation, this one, sabi ko nga, they will get, that's inside the nine dash line, that's inside the first island chain. And estimates, no? From USGS, United States uh, uh, Geographical Survey, estimate about 64 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Uh, Forum Energy estimate about 223 billion cubic feet of na natural gas. Felix estimate is about 4.8 billion barrels of oil. Forum Energy estimate about 21 billion barrels of oil. USGS uh, estimate 28 billion barrels of oil. And China estimate is about 213 billion barrels of oil. And that's equivalent to the Alaska's oil reserves and more than the reserves in the Gulf of Mexico. And ito po yung pag-asa natin para mabayaran ng ating mga utang. Ganong kahalaga, ganong kahalaga itong Reed Bank na ito. Yeah. That's how important Reed Bank and that's how important Panatag Shoal is. So we have to protect, by all means, you know, Panatag Show. Uh, I think I have to end now. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you... I have a conclusion from this one. Anyway, uh, my conclu conclusion is... Uh, No, anyway, uh, I'll just state my conclusion that uh, uh, Dr. J. Batumbakal mentioned about the three options, the legal, the bilateral, and the multilateral options. And that's a part of our uh, diplomatic and legal instruments of national power. But of course, as I stand before you as member of, as member of the National Security Council, <coughs> there are four other instruments of national power that we are using right now. The first is political, in diplomatic and uh, legal, uh, nasabi ko na, the information, informational instrument, then we can use our economic instrument, and the last one, is our military instruments. And we have to use, sama-sama po natin gamitin ang ating instruments of nas national power uh, to protect and defend our uh, maritime strategic interest, all this in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, that's all for my, uh, for my end, and very much willing to answer all your questions later on. Thank you very much, Paul.
Rear Admiral Damag, thank you for that. Just for uh, everyone's reference, uh, the TCFs, there is trillion cubic feet of gas. Um, Malampaya produces, uh, provides, the production from Malampaya produces and provides electricity to Luzon. For example, in this Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Theater, four of ten light bulbs are lighted by Malampaya. And Reed Bank resources uh, have much, much more than Malampaya. So you could imagine the energy sufficiency we could de de derive from that. Okay, our second reactor is Professor Herman Joseph, Joseph Santos Kraft. Professor Herman Joseph Santos Kraft, Kraft obtained his Bachelor of Arts degree in History from UP in 1984. He received his Master of Arts degree in Strategic Studies from the Australian National University in 1994. Professor Kraft started teaching in the Department of Political Science in UP in 1987. In 1988, he was also a lecturer at the Department of Political Science of De La Salle University. From 1996 to 2002, he was a teaching assistant in York University, teaching Introduction to Political Science, Introduction to International Relations, and International Migration. He continues to teach today at the Department of Political Science in UP as an associate professor. Professor Kraft has had vast research and project experience for local and international organizations. He has reviewed, co-written, and written numerous articles relating to geopolitical security concerns, especially those in the Asia-Pacific region, human rights, the peace process, and other topics in his fields of expertise. He was the executive director of the Institute for Strategic and Developmental Studies. Professor Kraft was the UPAA Northern California at Berkeley Centennial Profession Professorial Chair. He was an exchange fellow under the Southeast Asian Fellowship Program of the East-West Center, Washington, D.C. He received the York, the York University Graduate Studies Award for Academic Excellence. He's a visiting research fellow, Pacific Forum, CSIS. Professor Kraft was a recipient of the John and Catherine MacArthur Scholarship. On a personal note, uh, I knew Professor, uh, Professor Kraft as a... <laughs> Now he's shaking his head because I asked permission to say this. I knew him as a tactical officer and he was one of the kinder uh, tactical officers we had. <laughs> Professor Kraft, the stage is yours, sir. Thanks, Iris. Um, actually, when they asked me to uh, to, to send my CV. I didn't realize that they intend to read everything uh, that was there. Uh, so I'm sorry for the uh, rather long introduction, but uh, thanks nonetheless. Um, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, which means that this is going to be quite short. I'm, I don't intend to actually uh, uh, give uh, a third lecture, if you will, um, and rather to just talk about some of the main points that uh, Professor Batumbakal, uh, Batumbakal actually talked about and try to present uh, 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 some additional points that, uh, that need to be taken into consideration as far as those issues are actually concerned. I think if you go back to what was uh, presented by Professor Batong Bakal, um, to my mind there were four main points that could actually be taken from it as a basis for, for discussion. Um, general ones, non, uh, but, but nonetheless things that could be expanded uh, uh, for further uh, uh, discussion. Um, the first one is the idea that um, if you look at this particular issue, you know, I think the most important thing that comes out as far as the uh, presentation uh, uh, was discussed was the, um, was the degree of the lack of self-restraint you know, that came out of the, uh, this, the, um, uh, the exchanges you know, that took place between uh, uh, the Philippines and China you know, uh, in, in this particular issue, um, which led to, of course, concerns about how how high the level of tensions had actually increased you know, over the, uh, the, the two-month uh, uh, standoff. Uh, tensions that are by no means at all ended at this point in time as there continues to be exchanges you know, between the two countries you know, accusing each other of one thing or the other. Um, secondly, uh, is I think what becomes important is the extent to which one has to separate, if you will, you know, differentiate between the issue of uh, the Kalayan Island group 
No? Um, and uh, the claim that we have to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Panatag Show, uh, meaning to say that there, these are two different issues, there are two different uh, 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 contexts no? to which we should actually look at, uh, 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 at these two issues, and, and we shouldn't necessarily put them together, lumping them together as, as one particular uh, uh, concern. There two, uh, being two issues, basically this means that there are two different approaches that we should take to, to each of them. Um, and third, and this now starts off some of the, I think, important things that we have to, we have to take into consideration, no? is how wrong we have been no? as far as our approach to uh, the issue uh, is concerned. No? Um, he talks about the idea that, uh, uh, the, uh, I think uh, the Admiral also talked about it, no? there have been three basic approaches that have been considered. No? Um, one is the legal option, no? wherein we've constantly threatened to uh, take uh, uh, China to, uh, uh, to an international tribunal. No? Um, and in doing so, assert our sovereignty. No, over uh, uh, our, uh, our sovereign claims over the uh, the show itself, um, this creates the condition of confrontation. No, uh, uh, the context of confrontation that we're actually uh, uh, facing now, which we are unfortunately no uh, 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 still having problems with in terms of, uh, in terms of trying to resolve. Um, second is to look at this from a bilateral standpoint, no? one which, of course, we have rejected no? uh, uh, simply because of the asymmetric power relations between us and China, meaning to say that because of our weaker position as far as negotiations with China are concerned, there is no way that we can actually uh, negotiate bilaterally with China and win or be able to get something out of the uh, uh, arrangement. No? Um, and third no, um, is the multilateral approach, no? um, which, of course, comes together with the first one, uh, in as much as we've actually tried to get ASEAN on board, no, uh, uh, the main arguments we've actually presented. Um, all of these three things no, are interesting uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the, the three approaches, anyway, are actually interesting precisely because of what Professor Batung Bakal said was an emerging, no, um, a group think that was actually in place no, as far as our decision makers are actually concerned. No? Um, there's no discussion about the uh, idea of a legal option. There is no discussion about why we cannot deal bilaterally with China. No? And of course, the, uh, uh, the extent to which we believed so much no, in the multilateral approach, no, uh, 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 looking at ASEAN as our, uh, as our ally, so to speak, in this particular issue. No? Uh, a, a viewpoint that was unfortunately uh, proven uh, problematic no, with the recent inability of the ASEAN to come up with a joint statement no, which would include a statement on uh, this particular issue uh, at the 45th uh, ASEAN Ministerial Meeting. Um, now, these three things no, lead to the fourth, no, uh, 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 fourth key point that uh, uh, Professor uh, Batumbako was saying. How do we then actually approach this issue? the best way would in fact be to try to actually change the narrative, to change the context within which we actually try to discuss this thing. Instead of looking at it no, in terms of a sovereignty issue, for instance, no, we should actually look at it in terms of a, re uh, a, a uh, reorganization of how we look at security, the security context of the issue. In which case he was actually saying that the best way to do it would basically to, to try to look at this in terms of number one, no, um, uh, environmental security, the need to protect no, the biodiversity of the area, no, which of course not only serves the interests of the Philippines, no, actually has no, a global and international uh, uh, attraction. No? In that context, then, we are actually making an appeal not only to our own unilateral interests, no, but to an interest that actually uh, takes in uh, other players no? um, without necessarily uh, 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 threatening uh, 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 China. Um, and then, of course, you can actually look at it also in terms of the idea of food security, no? um, which is not necessarily unilateral, although one could actually look at it that way, no? but also, uh, also has an implication no, for, uh, uh, for regional uh, 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 cross-border relations. Um, and, and so, in, in this context, if you look at those four points that Professor Batung, Batung Bakal actually uh, uh, presented, no? um, the whole 
the whole thing actually hinges to a certain extent no, on how we are actually able to contextualize this particular issue. Now, I think it is important to look at this not, on, uh, not as an isolated uh, uh, issue. No, we're not looking at the confrontation between the Philippines and China as something that is actually devoid of a greater context, so to speak. No? Um, in fact, if one were to look at it from an international relations standpoint, no, um, at least four or five points actually come out, no? um, uh, which would help us understand to a greater extent no, uh, what it is that Professor uh, Batumbaka is actually trying to present. Number one is that, look, this whole thing is in fact something that is happening within the context of changing international conditions, right? We're not just talking about China becoming more assertive, so to speak, although the language in the newspapers no, and in the different, uh, uh, different media no, seems to actually uh, suddenly talk about no, a, a turnaround no, in China's approach to the whole issue. Okay? Um, we're talking about a complete uh, uh, transformation no, within the international context. No? Um, uh, in, 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 in international relations terms, we're talking about a redistribution of power, so to speak. No? Um, China is not just rising. China is not just becoming more assertive. The whole thing is actually taking place no, within the context of a situation where in the, the, uh, uh, those states which had, no, uh, which determined uh, international order to a large extent in the last 20 years or so, no, are in fact becoming less and less influential. No? Um, you're talking about the crisis of capitalism, if you will, no? uh, uh, wherein you're talking about the way that the United States has become uh, uh, overstretched in terms of ins international commitments, no? and of course the domestic issues that have to do with, with regards to its economic uh, uh, recovery. Um, um, the relationship between China and the United States, to a large extent, no? um, is the dominant, or the, uh, increasingly the dominant feature of, if not the international system itself, no? Um, you can talk about it in terms of the do dominant feature of the Asia Pacific uh, uh, region, right? This emerging um, rivalry, if you will, or an, a de facto rivalry between the United States and, and, and China, is in fact um, where we should start looking at what is going on with the um, uh, with this issue of uh, of of, uh, uh, of Panatag Shoal. That is to say, that our interest in Panatag Shoal. No, is unfortunately no, actually caught within that larger context of a great power rivalry, great power dynamic no, uh, 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 that's actually emerging. Admiral Adamas, for instance, talked about the idea of the first island chain. No, the first island chain no, is not just a matter of trying to put up fences, uh, uh, so to speak, or uh, putting up uh, a, a, a new great wall of China no, on the sea lanes, no, but this is actually a defensive uh, 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 strategy on the part of China no, in terms of its attempt to balance, uh, not so much to balance, but to actually respond to uh, what it sees to be um, uh, American uh, um, uh, American uh, not so much, uh, well you can talk about it as encroachment into you know, China's core interests, so to speak. You know. It's quite interesting if you look at it in that sense you know, uh, because the first island chain it's supposed to be an area where China is determined to deny access to the United States no, in a wartime situation. Okay? But I think Professor Batumbakal actually made it clear no, that the whole situation right now is not to be seen in terms of the wartime situation precisely because in wartime, no, Panatanchol is practically going to be no, a useless outpost, so to speak. No? Its importance is in peacetime, that is to say as a potential outpost no, for uh, uh, for China's uh, 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 defensive uh, uh, arrangements no, um, uh, as far as its relations with, with the United States is concerned. Now, the question, of course, is we, do we want to play that particular game no, in, in, in relation to, uh, 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 to China, whether or not you know, our actions you know, as far as Panatag Shoal should in fact fit into that particular framework, or as he actually presents it, you know, we should actually talk about it in terms of our in the framing of our own interests no, over that particular issue. Um, second, no, um, coincident with this particular uh, uh, change no, in the international context, in the distribution of power, if you will, 
no, in international order, um, is the what it is that UNCLOS actually represents. No? Um, UNCLOS represents, even though it actually started off in 1982, no, UNCLOS is part of an, uh, uh, um, an emerging attempt no, to place the international order within a more, uh, a more stringently legal or normative frame. Okay? Um, this is, to a large extent, the post-Cold War uh, direction as far as international relations, or one of the directions of, the, of international relations, no post-Cold War. Okay? Um, that is to say that there's an increasing emphasis on, no, uh, on, on normative structures, normative, normative changes. No? Thus, thus, human rights actually comes in, the issue of sovereignty and how it actually impacts on the security of people, the idea of human security, all of this form part of that, of that uh, 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 changing narrative, if you will. No? But like I said, no, this is coincident with a changing international context. No? Um, that is to say, they're not necessarily uh, something that actually converged together. Now, these are strategic conditions. No? Um, if we want to further look at no, uh, 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 the context of this particular issue, um, a number of things actually come out no, at a more regional level. Number one is the issue of leadership succession in China. No? Um, there's always this, con uh, this, this, con uh, this, this concern about how leadership succession in communist countries in particular, but authoritarian ones and totalitarian ones no, in, in general, no, actually leads to uh, the need no, for that particular state to assert itself, no, um, either internationally no, as a signal to its domestic constituents no, or as a signal to its international uh, uh, rivals, if you will. No. Um, we face no, a, a, a change in, in leadership in China, and to a large extent, a, num a number of analysts actually say that we're not going to see a change in Chinese rhetoric until after no, uh, that leadership succession has actually changed, which means we're talking about November or so. No? Um, so which means that there's the potential that this whole thing could become even worse um, if we're not very careful about it. Um, secondly, no, is this whole thing is now situated within a change in U.S. strategy. No? Um, the statement of this, the U.S. Secretary of State no, of a U.S. pivot to the Asia-Pacific, no, of course, basically means that the United States is now going to increase its military presence in the region, increase its, uh, its, its influence, if you will, no, uh, through, that, uh, uh, through that presence, and of course, assert itself a little bit more no, through that military presence. Now, this is not necessarily going to be taken lightly by, by the Chinese, no? and, and to a certain extent would pr probably intensify that strategy about strengthening the first island chain uh, 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 line. Um, so what is interesting is that if you put this context no, together with what Professor Batong Bakal is actually saying, okay, um, does that mean then that we are unfortunately you know, placed in a situation where we don't have any choice at all, right? Um, given the increasing rivalry between the United States and, 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 and China, the increasing um, the increasing the emphasis on uh, on the importance of, of uh, uh, legal frames. No, um, what else do we actually have? Well, there's ASEAN, as they say, right? Unfortunately, no, ASEAN has shown itself to be inutile, if you will, no, on issues that have to do with trying to resolve these kinds of uh, 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 disputes. No, um, um, ASEAN is supposed to have been at the center of. No, in fact, is a driving force of East Asian integration. No? Um, and to a large extent, what the last ASEAN ministerial meeting has shown no, is that in the face of determined great power dynamics, no, ASEAN is unfortunately not going to be able to do anything at all. Right? So where are we at then? What is it that we are actually facing? And this brings us back to the recommendations presented to us by Professor Batung Bakal. No? His recommendations basically talk about the idea of new diplomacy or new diplomatic tact, if you will. Okay? Um, and which brings me now to a, uh, 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 a fundamental question. If you look at the first point that Professor Batong Bakal, uh, the third point that Professor Batong Bakal uh, uh, mentioned, now he's basically saying that, well, the first and the third point, no, is that the whole thing was actually generated by undiplomatic rhetoric on both sides. No? 
uh, which unfortunately escalated tensions, no? um, followed up by certain actions taken by both sides, no? which, which, which also contributed to the escalation of tensions. Um, and the thing is, we, the Philippines, on its side, no, made things worse by actually taking no, um, policies which were unfortunately just going to lead to further escalation of the issue. The question then is, in this kind of diplomatic uh, incompetence, if you will, no, um, are we really in any position to, uh, uh, to deal with this issue no, um, in the way that Professor Batong Bakal wants us, meaning to say that we actually need to do this diplomatically, we actually need a new approach, a new framing of the whole issue, no? And of course, good diplomacy to, in order to actually convince our partners that our position, no, since it is not taken to actually uh, 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 ensure Philippine sovereignty, but is actually taken for the greater good, no, um, is actually the proper way to, to go about it. No? Um, it seems to me that even as we have actually exhibited great, uh, uh, certain degree of leadership internationally when it comes to environmental issues, no? um, connecting environmental issues to a territorial dispute and then trying to actually uh, situate that dispute within the context of, 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 uh, 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 of the environment no? might really take a bit of diplomatic um, uh, maneuvering, if you will. No? One that unfortunately I do not see our, uh, 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 our foreign service you know, as having having exhibited no, in, in, in this particular case. Now, second, no, um, it's not just diplomacy. You're talking about trying to actually rein back no, uh, uh, sources of information. No? Um, one of the issues that actually uh, uh, comes out of this and which I think um, uh, Professor Batumbakal did not actually uh, touch on no, is of course the extent to which domestic nationalistic responses to the issues now have actually become uh, a prominent uh, 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 feature of, uh, uh, of the issue. You know, bloggers, microbloggers, you know, newspaper accounts, all of these things have actually contributed to a perception of heightened tensions. You know? um, there have been reports that there is a tendency to actually overestimate or overhype you know, uh, the extent to which state-controlled media is able to act, uh, in, the, in China is able to, um, uh, to mobilize uh, popular support. I'm not, I'm not in any way at all uh, um, able to determine the veracity of that particular point. However, no, um, given that both players no, are, are, are in fact um, uh, driven by uh, uh, increasing accounts, no, um, shriller uh, accounts of, uh, uh, of, this part, of this particular issue, no, the question is how do you actually uh, in what way can you actually control information no, so that you can change the narrative no, of the particular issue. We've been driven to the point where we're now talking about it no, in terms of sovereignty issues. And then suddenly the idea is to try to ratchet down the rhetoric no, in order to suddenly talk about no, um, reframing the whole thing in terms of envir uh, 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 environment, uh, the environment. I think this will again take quite a bit of uh, uh, um, political acrobatics. No? Um, one that uh, again uh, uh, depends on our political leadership not to pull off. No, again, uh, the unfortunate thing about foreign policy is that th these are two you know, important factors that uh, uh, that that uh, 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 that you need to possess in order to be able to have effective foreign policy. No, quality of leadership, political leadership, and the quality of diplomacy. No, which at this point in time, unfortunately, you no, know, we seem to have a problem being able to exhibit, no, as far as this particular issue is concerned. Um, having said that, no, um, I think Professor Batong Bako is to actually to be congratulated in terms of his the way that he's actually presented the whole thing. Much of his actually, what he has actually talked about, no, uh, is very different from how the issue has actually been represented. Okay, which then, of course, leads us to the main point that he had towards the end, that is to say that in this kind of issue, reflective thinking is probably one thing that we should actually have. And so, thank you very much for the time and your uh, attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Kraft. Uh, as Professor Kraft takes his seat, uh, we invite our uh, listeners or those present here uh, to come um, approach the mic stands at the aisle and ask uh, your questions of our lecturer and reactors. Uh, in, before you ask your question, kindly identify yourself as well as the organization or school you, uh, you belong to. Yes. <clears throat> Mike, please. Mike. Hello. I'm Professor Gila Ganon of the University of the Philippines. I'm a professor and lecturer. Uh, I'm also a member of UB Vanguard. I was commandant of the UPROTC from 2009 to 2012, three years. During that time, UP was the best ROTC unit in Metro Manila for two years. We beat uh, 20 colleges and universities. It just so happened that the commanding general reserve command read a outmoded the provision of the policies that no reservist can be a commandant. So we were all removed as commandant in Metro Manila. That was the story behind it. Anyway, I'm also a graduate of the Command General Staff College and National Defense University. Two of my commandants are here, General Adan and General Rio. They taught me strategy. That's the direction of my comment this morning. We have enough information about the problem in this Pratlis and Panatek Shoal to make sound decision. The only problem is we don't have the political will to make one. To borrow the lecture from General Adan, strategy is the end, the how, and the means. The end is clear. The means and the how has been discussed in National Defense College for quite a while. The author of that means and the strategy is here, General Rosales. He discussed with us the one and a half war strategy. And General Victor Corpus, the invisible army. You combine these two, we have enough strategy to, to fight the Chinese in Spratlis or Panatek Shoal. <laughs> when, when President Corey was, uh, newly state, was newly instated as president, he sent uh, Vice President Laurel to China to meet with Deng Xiaoping. And Vice President Laurel raised the issue of Spratlis. <laughs> Deng Xiaoping told him, that's why it's called China Sea, because it's ours. You have Philippine Sea, that's yours. That was the end of it. You were discussing General Agdamag about their second line of defense. When they start moving towards that, they should have the Philippines, not just Scarborough Shoal. And they will have also Benham Rice. What we need in this country is the political will to do it. I remember when I was taking a advanced uh, officer's course in the reserve, I have a classmate, a major, was telling me that he was sent to one of the islands in Spratlis to destroy the registration of Malaysia. He was the demolition officer. He was secured by the Marines. The Malaysians didn't make any quack about it when we destroyed that uh, station. Any Markers from China should be removed and destroyed by us. <laughs> or we should tow all our scrap battleships to Panatag Shoal and stack it there and man it with Marines. <laughs> uh, in one of our discussion, in, I'm also a member of the Strategic Studies Group of National Defense College. We, we have this discussion for almost every, every week about security issues. You, your diplomatic uh, position is useless if you don't have the military muscle to back it. We cannot count on the U.S. because the U.S. has more interest with China than they have with us. 
the common interest of U.S. is just the freedom of navigation. Economic interest, they have greater economic interest with China than with us. So it's up to us to defend our assets and territory. That's all, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Rear Admiral Agdamag, maybe the National Security Council can, can heed from the advice. Uh, our, our naval ships as navigational hazards. <laughs> Sink them and make them navigational hazards. The distinguished, the one and only uh, Rhea Apostol. I, I, can I, I say that. something about, okay, can so. I make a, a very short reply? Uh, if you notice uh, in my presentation, the Ayungan, Ayungin Shoal. The Ayungin Shoal is, uh, uh, there's an LST right now sitting on Ayungin Shoal. And that started uh, in 1997 when we put that uh, uh, LST right there in Panatag Shoal. Dinala na natin yung, yung ano, China protested, we removed the LST and put it in uh, Ayungan Shoal. So, Actually, your, yeah, sir, your suggestion was, was uh, given credence uh, in 1997. But of course, since malakas yung uh, the Chinese protest against our government, we easily give in. But of course, uh, we're thinking of other courses of action. No? Sabi ko nga, it's not only legal, diplomatic, but we're also we're taking economic, information, political, so forth and so on. So we're everything in uh, everything. We're we're thinking of a lot of uh, courses of action to resolve uh, this standoff and return to the status quo ante before this standoff, uh, April 8 of 2012. So ganun na ganun na situation. We're looking for ways and means to return to that status quo ante and probably talk on less sensitive maritime issues like environment, food, so forth and so on. And remove first sovereignty issues, kumbaga. Thank you. As we are uh, discussing national security issues here, may we, f may we first know from the audience if any one of you is from the Chinese media? <laughs> okay, so we're clear. Go on, sir. I know this uh, distinguished gentleman, but kindly identify yourself and your organization, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. My name is uh, Ray Apostol, and uh, I happen to be uh, the one in charge of Forum Energy and the one in charge of Red Bank Project. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, checking out if uh, anyone from the audience is from China, <laughs> because uh, right now we're talking about uh, national issues. I just want to <clears throat> inform the group that uh, I have been doing this uh, subsurface exploration of Red Bank since the early 90s. And uh, I have been using data that were acquired in early 70s. In fact, we have drilled six wells in that area without any question from China. We acquired about 6,000 line kilometers of 2D seismic without any questions from China. And recently, well, in 1995, and I think uh, General Adamag, I, I think you know my name, because I was the one who, who um, uh, managed the program for the, for the seismic acquisition in Red Bank by Kirkland Resources. And recently, uh, I, we finished the 3D seismic of uh, Sampagita gas field, plus acquiring another 2,000 line flooders of 3D seismic. What we're saying here is that, that, uh, that the, the Red Bank area has been part of our, our uh, territory. Sure. We've been doing work, and in 1995, we were doing 2D seismic, and the, and the Chinese contingent in, uh, in the Kalayan area would just uh, wave at us. No question. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a runway in uh, Pagasa Island, and uh, we frequently do some uh, discussions with these people uh, inhabiting the islands. The Chinese contingent there were not, were not as aggressive as now. There is, there is really an, a, a pronounced aggressiveness from China. Why? First, <clears throat> let's go back to uh, the issue of uh, JMSU. Uh, this is the Joint Marine Survey undertaking, which was 
promoted by the Philippine government. We have to understand that. It was promoted by the Philippine government. And, uh, under the guise that uh, they wanted to, um, they wanted to uh, uh, put, put this area of, conf of potential conflict into an area of cooperation. Apparently, the JMSU was acquired within our area. It was supposed to be acquired outside of, uh, I mean, farther to the west in the uh, disputed area. That encouraged China to do, you know, to come and uh, be, be aggressive in their stance. If you look, look at it now, the area, the area that you're talking about, Scarborough Shoal, other, the, other than its, uh, its uh, rich, uh, uh, rich in, 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 in fish and, other, and other, other, other living things, it's not what they want. What they want is the West Philippine Sea. I mean, West, West Palawan. Uh, well, I keep on saying West Philippine Sea because I was the first one to name that one in Singapore. I made a presentation in Singapore and I called it West Philippine Sea. That was back in 1997. And I, and, uh, I got the ire of the of, uh, Chinese contingent. And uh, their interest is in Red Bank, in that general area. Why? Because they basically know what's underneath it. In the geological map or offshore, off, offshore geology that uh, Professor Jay uh, showed, uh, by the way, uh, Professor, we're together in one of the lectures in CIL uh, in Singapore. If you look at it, the uh, prospects of hydrocarbon west of Luzon is not really good compared to west of Palawan. I was told by some, some friends in China, because you have to understand China, uh, China within, uh, within. There are different groups. There are different groups having different interests. Imagine a country that, ha that has five national oil companies. It has five national oil companies. And each of these national oil companies will contest, con will, 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 uh, uh, will outdo each other. So what they're saying is that, what they're saying is that China through CNOC is interested in West Palawan. That's it. They're interested in the offshore side of Vietnam, wherever the oil is. It's not really the, it's not really the, it's not really the uh, aquatic resources, it's not that. It's, it's what's underneath. And it so happened that we have it. Yesterday, I had a meeting with uh, Secretary Almendras. Uh, it's a closed door meeting. And, uh, well, Uh, we we were told that uh, that area will be will be ours, is ours, and they'll fight, like, and they'll fight anybody who'll take it away from us. That's a general, that's a very general, uh, very general statement. But of course, you know, you, as uh, my tactical officer, uh, Professor Kraft, saying there there is a, a very big disparity. As, uh, there is an uh, asymmetry in the. You know, uh, in Philippines and China, in terms of uh, you know economic uh, might, uh, military might. So we really we cannot. And what and like what uh, uh, Professor Agano was saying, you know, we cannot really be just talking here. We have to encourage uh, participation of uh, of uh, the international community. I have talked. I've talked to several oil companies and they're interested in Red Bank. Shell, Shell, Shell uh, <laughs> gave me a proposal that they will buy into Red Bank, ready to be signed. The next day, uh, they got a call from, China, from, uh, from their head office in China telling them that if they will come in and uh, Farm into Red Bank, all of their all of their business business exposure in China will be put in jeopardy. Not only Shell, I talked to a lot of other big big companies because developing that gas and oil in Red Bank is going to be a challenge. No Filipino Filipino oil company can do it on its own. You believe me? 
So it's going to be a big boys game. We need big. We need. We need the big time, big bo big companies, big oil companies to do it with us. Of course, we'll be there. Uh, the resources is there. That's ours, and we, and we have to fight for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, clearly stated by our president, President Benigno S. Aquino III, we'll protect Reed Bank as if we're protecting Recto Avenue. So, ganong katindi ang... Uh, so, we in the security sector, we in the armed forces, doing all our best, you know, finding all courses of action to protect and defend not only Reed Bank, but also Kalayan Island Group, and Panatag Island. Ganun po ang, ang instruction given to us by the President. Thank you. you know, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rear Admiral Agnamag. Uh, the gentleman who just spoke, uh, Re, um, Mr. Um, Vanguard, Ray Apostol, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, he is in the oil and gas, upstream oil and gas industry, one of the brightest stars. He's the manag managing director of uh, Forum Energy. I know because uh, they're clients of ours. I, work, I am in the service uh, part of the upstream oil and gas industry. Okay. Uh, Good morning. My Bruce. classmate uh, who doesn't remember me. <laughs> of course I remember him. It's only that I have bad eyesight now. That's why you were so far away and when then you were... You know, no, Suzette, we... I'm okay. I'm, okay. I, 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 I went through denial. I, I don't have the denial anymore. Just tell me it's the hair. <laughs> or lack thereof. Cute Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Good morning or good afternoon to um, to everybody here. First of all, I would like to congratulate our speaker today, Dr. Jay Batumbakal, and the two reactors, Admiral Agdamag and Professor Kraft, for um, enlightening us and the rest of the country. I hope on the um, on the complex issues that are um, involved in the dispute concerning Panatag Shoal. Now. Um, I think I have um, forgotten to introduce myself. My name is Suzette Suarez. I'm from the Center for International Ocean Law. Um, like the um, speaker, I'm also he from the UP College of Law, and I also used to be um, um, associated with the UP uh, Law Center Institute for International Legal Studies. Now, um, I understand why... Um, the 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 main premise of the lecture is that we have to um, not only focus on the legal. This is what I understand that the Dr. Bartombakal is um, telling us. We only we, we should not only focus on the legal issues. Meaning we should not only look at the legal options. Um, presumably he is referring um, primarily to the um, announcement of the DFA of. Um, taking uh, the dispute uh, to court or to avail of any of the dispute settlement mechanisms under the United Nations Convention for the Law of the Sea. Uh, um, uh, the, the issue concerning Panatag Shoal is wider than um, the title to territory or the sovereignty issues. Now, having said that, I, in my view, it is not necessarily an exclusive... Uh, the... the, um, um, the um, the goals of government should not necessarily be uh, just focused on one. And when we say we should also look at the environmental and security issues, I agree with that. But we should not. Uh, we should also um, insist on um, insist on uh, a consistent, sound, and legal approach. And this includes um, um, maintaining our position, maintaining our position, or um, continuing our quest to consolidate our title or perfect our title to um, Scarborough Shoal or Panatag Shoal. I think it is um, um, very important to understand the the long term context of um, consolidation of title to territory. Just because um, the government um, presumably failed to convince China now to go to um, court to settle the issue on title to territory doesn't mean that it cannot be convinced perhaps um, years from now. And if, we, uh, if the government in, wants to invite China to go to court um, on Panatag Shoal to, issue, to, to settle the issue on title to territory, um, it should already be actually be prepared to 
indeed bring such a case to court, the question is, are we prepared? You know, if you bring a case to a local court, you go to your lawyer, your lawyer will first have to um, determine his or her litigation strategy. You have to prepare a case. You know, you cannot think of a case now. You think you go, want to go to court um, now and you want to file a case six months later or end of, end of this before the year ends. It doesn't work that way. So if we um, even think of going to court at some point, it should always be one of our goals. This is my view, and I think I, um, Dr. Batumbaka shares this view. Now, going to court should always be one of our options, but this is an option that would not be available to us if we are unprepared, and I think we are not prepared at this point. Um, well, not to mention the procedural um, obstacles that we face right now. Many of you have heard, reading from the newspapers, that... Um, um, we need China's consent before we could go to court. This is true. This is one of the cases that we really need uh, the consent of the other party if you want to settle the issue on the title to territory. Um, in the meantime, I think um, the work of our um, diplomats, um, the, well, they need to work on this. You know, again, just because um, you invite China now, a few months ago, to go to court doesn't mean that they would say yes right away. Maybe they will never say yes, but we don't know this. So um, I would come to my um, point that I do agree that we need to have a bilateral mechanism to um, not only to settle the dispute, maybe the, the, the dispute will not be settled during our lifetime, but basically to manage, to manage the dispute. And we cannot keep on um, turning um, to a multilateral organization like the ASEAN, for example. Dr. Batumbakal made this very clear, and I, 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 I really agree on this, that um, the... There are uh, issues that are pertaining or relevant only to the claimants, to, to um, the, 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 the feature, to the rock. And the other ASEAN states, including even the United States, other, other states um, cons um, with interest in the region, in particular the United States, they don't have an interest in the title and the sovereignty issues. So we need to have a bilateral um, mechanism with China, and we are not saying that this is going to be uh, an easy um, job for our diplomats to do, but this has to be done. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Suzette. Uh, we still have uh, 15 minutes for the question, so uh, we invite everyone. Good morning, sir. Uh, I am Rex Ubak from the Presidential Commission on the Visiting Forces Agreement and the student of the Political Science Department. Uh, my question is about uh, refocusing the context of our territorial claim from sovereignty to environment and food security. Now, if we're going to use that appeal, if you will say, or a mechanism or a strategy, what assurance could we get that China would buy that? And second, will that remain as a diplomatic strategy to seek the support of the international community to keep pressuring China to give in? And if we're going to use that approach, what would be the most appropriate? Would it be unilateral, bilateral, or a multilateral approach? Thank you. So our reactors, three questions yeah. there. Uh, with respect to the approaches that I laid out, uh, with, um, oh, no, sorry, the alternative framing of the issue, these are really alternative ways of thinking about how to approach the problem. So it's not a case of replacing one track with the other. It's a case of seeing that there are many different tracks, there are many different ways to skin the cat. And right now, it's pretty clear that banging away at territorial, sovereign, territorial integrity and sovereignty is that we're deadlocked. Neither side will give. And I guess that's, a, that's like a wake up call that you cannot keep using that uh, every time something happens. You cannot keep using the US card every time something like this happens. It's lo more looking, this, this alternative ways of doing things, I think, as I said, or I think I referred to it, is really more of for the future, not really, not necessarily for just this issue. No? Where if we're at the deadlock at this point on Scarborough Shoal, then obviously things need to cool down first. Things need to be reestablished. For one thing, com good communications need to be reestablished first. No? Uh, and then uh, when, if, one of those, um, what do you call this? One of those possible uh, um, scenarios come up, no? and hopefully the scenario that comes up is that nobody's occupying the shoal. 
then what that means is that we will expect more of these kinds of incidents in the future. Hopefully, we should be, be, be much more uh, well prepared on how to address it when it does come up again, and that we will not go back to this this uh, mode of, oh, it's, it's an invasion of the Philippine territory, blah, blah, blah. Because it has been clear, the experience in the past few months has been clear that if we do that, we basically stand alone. And if the idea is for us to get multilateral support, then we should not be going that same track again. We need a new strategy. We need a new approach, exactly. So that's why we're laying out these options. Whether China will buy it, of course, there's no assurance at all that China will do anything that we think it want, that we want it to do. Each and every agent is free, may act in, in ways entirely different from how you want them to act. But the point is to be able to, to try a different track and to be able to uh, anticipate the different ways by which they may respond. No? It, a, a good strategy would be prepared for contingencies. If they don't respond well to this question and, and they disrupt, respond in this way, we should be prepared to, for the next step. Right? That's, how, that's how good strategy is supposed to work. You're prepared for all the possible contingencies you can anticipate. So this is one way. Uh, um, expanding your options, your approaches, is one way of uh, uh, developing that kind of uh, multi-pronged strategy, a much more flexible strategy. Uh, than what we have been pursuing. My fear really is that since it's already clear that we didn't get anywhere in the last three months, the only, our options are narrowing. And uh, the most fearsome, option I, uh, fearsome scenario I'm looking at is that, event, it's, is that uh, they will use that narrowing of options as an excuse to occupy the shoal. In which case, it's, it's over. I mean, game, game over. There's not much we can do. Yeah. Thank you. Mangga Thank you. Po. Uh, may tanong po kami dito. May dula pa kami tatanong kayo. Mare. Okay, I was about to call the lady. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, next. Sir. All right. So, oh, three okay. persons in one. Yeah. Actually, hindi. Tatlo kami. Mag-iba. Okay. Mangga nang maga. Uh, ako po si Simon. May tanong po kay, uh, dito kay Director, Deputy Director General Agdamag. May binagit po kay kanina na uh, there were some lessons learned or there's some lessons that we should have learned during World War II. Uh, when Japan invaded Philippines. I'd like to know what were those lessons that we should have learned uh, in relation to what's happening right on the Fanatic Shoal. And my second question then is, uh, when you went to the uh, to Mischief Reef in 95 and saw the structures there, the steel structures, why were they not destroyed or why did you not destroy them when you saw them, knowing that they were from a foreign or foreign entity? so that they would not have built the structures that they built there now, or at least send them a message saying that, you know, this is our land, keep out. And that, yeah, well, that's it. Salamat. Before the Admiral answers, uh, may we have your name, sir, and your organization? Simon. 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 Okay, sir. Organization. Uh, I belong to a 95 million member organization. All right. Philippines. Thank you, sir. Admiral, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, from uh, lessons learned from uh, World War II, first, of course, uh, uh, we should invest in our military. Now, uh, when we rely on the Americans during World War II, what they gave us are Enfield rifles. During that time, ang sikat was the Garan, no? But what they gave us was Enfield rifles, were Enfield rifles used during World War I. So, ganun, if we rely and rely on other people for our defense, what we will get are second-hand equipment. So we have to rely. Sabi nga ni Dr. J, we should rely on ourselves, no? Because we understand. Yeah. We understand the problem. We, 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 we know what we want to have. So that's uh, uh, lessons learned. And the other thing, you know, when I went to Mischief Reef, you know, uh, I was facing three ships. I was only one. And they were uh, imposing a maritime exclusion zone of five nautical miles. That's what we are doing in Malampaya right now. 
Pag may lumapit na within 5 nautical miles, any craft inside 5 nautical ma- miles in Malampaya, uh, we will impose an exclusion zone and try to uh, block the path of that uh, watercraft. So, ganun ang ginagawa nila sa mischief reefs. There are three of them, three ships, two fisheries coming from the fisheries bureau, and one frigate. So, paano ka lalaban pag ganun? So, you're just, uh, sabi ko nga, there are two tasks given to a commanding officer. Accomplishment of the mission and safety and welfare of your men. Pag hindi mo ginawa yun, napatayan ka, you're a failure. So, you have to look, you have to be wise, no? Use your own uh, good judgment in uh, in accomplishment of your mission, safety and welfare of your men. Now, knowing all this, lessons learned, lessons learned. So we have to invest, no, invest in our equipment. Invest in our military, not only with our I'm sure you have very good legal team, no, in UP, Gandang, but uh, sabi ko nga, when, when uh, you talk of sovereignty in uh, China, they will first, first, let's uh, finish, let's uh, decide on the issue first. Ganun ang China. Let's decide on sovereignty first before you talk on other subject matter. So that's how firm the Chinese are. No? So, uh, me as a coming from a military you know military background i think uh, our our diplomats are very professional uh, secretary del rosario very professional diplomat again uh, really if you talk of multilateral convincing other countries to join us really really very difficult so some bottom line is we really depend on our own selves depend on our uh, depend on our resources, depend on our own uh, uh, self-sufficiency. No? Self-sufficiency is the bottom line here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very good question and a very good answer. Now, uh, we could read between the lines and understand why the government lets uh, the diplomats and politicians talk to the media and not people like uh, Rear Admiral Kama. Now, we're going to The gentleman standing at the mic. Stand. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Dodi Lagbampo, sa University of the Philippines Board. And uh, uh, first is the, uh, for Dr. J, if you have uh, some notes that you can share with the university, you could probably share it with our co-Filipinas all over the world through our UP uh, alumni website. And uh, we can get a good feedback from them and they are very very much interested with regards to this issue. Second is I'd like to greet uh, maybe the son of Joe Agdamag, if you're the son of Joe Agdamag. He's the, uh, is my co-shooter during that time. He was though the yeah, older version. I was the youngest in the team of the Philippine shooting team and our POI was the snipers group. And uh, uh, I also belong to the UP Vanguard, of course, of class 1970. Uh, I'd like to take off from the point of one issue, which is the right framing of the question, proper question, in arriving in a solution vis-a-vis the options that you have in the Security Council. You have from the political position to the military action which you have options and you use them accordingly how the situation arises. The situation is, I've got three talking points which you would like to answer or just probably believe, but my first talking point is the territorial imperative and claim of the island or, or the shoal of Panatag Shoal. How important is the shoal? 
Is the important based on the economic or on the factual legal issue? Is it the pride or the economic issue? On the first talking point, the, uh, the option on the economic issue may be far more relevant if it does give our country the economic value. The legal issue is a se separate issue with, with regards to our framework of pride, nationalism, and love of country. With regards to uh, the hesitation, the hesitation of our country, of our posturing, with regards to the apparent bullying of a giant or a Goliath versus a dragonfly, as Senator Santiago has said, with a vessel of fishing boats accompanied by a warship, probably a, in, a, in a form of a warship, and our stand posturing position of doing nothing and keeping secret makes me wonder whether we are just simply cannot afford to fight or we're just simply so embarrassed to give an answer. My uh, last talking question is, is this question of the Panatag Shoal an intractable, intractable dispute? To those who would understand the intractable issue, the intractable issue could be related to the issue of the land dispute versus in, in the area of the Middle East, like the Israel and Palestine, or the island of Mindanao, Mindanao versus in the, in the time of the Spanish to the American to the present era, down to the present where we are, there is no solution. And the same, thing, same, same issue as were the Philippines or the uh, Middle East right now where Israel and Palestine is right now. I'd like to put that question to you as to where we would put ourselves. Um, by way of profession, I am an investment banker and a an mediator. Thank you very much, sir. Did our reactors get that? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. With respect to the first question, um, um, is this a legal issue? Is this an economic issue? Uh, that's a very interesting question because I myself am asking it in terms of economically how valuable is this place to us? What is its real connection to the Philippines? Because that, the, the answer to that question I, I do not know. And I don't think anyone has even done the basic study of finding out, for example, what is the fisheries production uh, that contributes. Okay? Although it, it's clear that it does contribute something, but how much? This is unlike in, say, the, in the Palawan area where it is clear that Palawan provides about 20% of the fishery production of the country, which is very significant. But when it comes to, to just a Scarborough Shoal itself, the answer is not clear. But this is something that should have been clear at the outset. That's what I'm wondering. Is it a purely legal issue? Well, no, I think legal, legal issues arise out of practical reality in the first place. So we cannot really say that it's a purely legal issue. There is a legal aspect to it, and there is a legal controversy that can exist and that is, which we can find out, which we can fight out. But having said that, that doesn't mean it's limited to that. Um, hesitation in the face of bullying. I don't think we hesitated. Uh, what I, the hesitation I, I pointed out was the hesitation to use force. If, because that was the logical response to what was being portrayed as an invasion or a, 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 an invasion of ter territorial integrity. Right? The logical response should be self-defense, but it is not. So there is a disconnect, as I see it, in the way we understand the issue and the way that we respond. So why does that disconnect exist? One possible answer is maybe we do not really understand clearly what is the interest we're trying to protect. 
because everything is lumped up into territorial integrity. No? But so, that's something that really bears discussion. Um, is it an intractable issue? That's a good question. Definitely it's not the same as in the Middle East no? because uh, there, are, there aren't people there yet, at least. Uh, for now, for as long as the shoal is unoccupied, I don't think it's an intractable issue because it's, it's basically the same kind of issue elsewhere in the world. Maritime issues are functional issues. Over, uh, count, uh, competing claims to fisheries, resources, etc. All of these are also taking place elsewhere in the world and there are solutions that have been tried and they seem to be working in other places. So, as long as the shoal is unoccupied, the possibility exists that those kinds of solutions can be applied here. That's why I'm worried about an actual occupation taking place ostensibly having been provoked by the situation. So to me, that is much more important to prevent, you know, preventing an actual occupation, rather than thinking of it in terms of maintaining territorial integrity. We need to disassemble, in a way, the problem into specific sub-problems, and we need, perhaps we can achieve our objective by ab addressing that the real problem, the real component problem, rather than this whole vague territorial integrity problem. Yeah. Okay, w well, we have time for one last question. Uh, the lady. Salamat po sa pagkakataong ito. Ayoko sanang tumayo, pero gusto ko lang pong um, magsalita talaga kasi um, bago ko sabihin yung point ko, tapos na ba tayo sa pagdadalamahati kay Dolphy? Kasi po sa media, yan ang ating nababasa, no? Pero sinasakop na tayo, eh, Dolphy pa rin tayo, pinag-uusapan si media. So, hindi ko po alam kung yan ay intentional na ginagawa ng gobyerno at intentional na ginagawa ng media na hindi pa alam sa mga mama yung Pilipino ang nangyayari sa Panatag Shoal. Dahil, sabi, is sugarcoat nyo man o hindi ang nangyayari, yan po ay... Sabi nila hindi invasion, pero nandun na sila. So, anong tawag natin doon? So, isugar, pagtakpan man natin ang lahat ng pangyayari, ay eh, talagang nandun po na ang in-check. At sabi nga nung kababatang in-check sa aming ano, na, ngayon eh, malaki na sabi ko, bakit naman kinukuha nyo ang teritoryo namin, ang aming, uh, sabi niya, ikaw naman, ako ay Pilipino din. Dito na nga ako sinilang eh, ako din ay Pilipino, sabi nung kababata kong in-check. Sabi niya, hindi naman nila, hindi naman nila inaagaw yon Gusto lang nila i-share. Sabi ko, i-share? Eh, hindi kayo nagpapaalam kung gusto niyo mag-share, sabihin mo sa mga kamag-anak mo sa China, magpaalam naman. At kung gusto niyo i-share, eh, magpaalam kayo ng maayos. Huwag yung nandun na kayo sa sabihin yung inyo. So, ito lang po ang sabi, ang observation ko, Kasi po, English tayo ng English, ang mga mga Pilipino hindi naiunawaan kung anong nangyayari. So, kung naunawaan po yan ng mga 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 Pilipino, maintindahan namin ang ating admiral dito, ang ating mga Navy, na nagpapakahirap proteksyon na ng ating teritoryo. At, uh, Mr. Batong Bakal, uh, with due respect to your very wide-ranging, ano, uh, kung hindi po ito issue ng uh, territorial integrity at sovereignty ay ano po ito? Wala tayong pinag-uusapan kung hindi po ito isyo ng sovereignty. Yun lang po. Okay. Uh, magandang puno naman yung sinabi niya na magtagalog tayo. No? Pero, well, siguro nga yun kasi yung default position natin dahil nandito tayo sa pamantasan ng Pilipinas. Uh, sa tot ang totoo niyan, uh, mga, nung isang buwan, nagsalita ako sa isa, dun sa Malati Church sa isang uh, sa mga tao na mga local community talaga mga ordinary mga isda mga ngalakal mga naka, mga uh, informal settlers doon at talagang hinihirin din nila yung paliwanag tungkol dito sa Panatag Shoal o Baho de Masinlok at binigay ko nga yung buong spill din doon sa kanila sa Tagalog kaya hindi naman siguro natin masasabi na hindi ito uh, pwedeng gawin no uh, or na hindi ko ginagawa. Uh, sa katunayan niya, natuwa ako na sa kauna-unahang pagkakataon, uh, mga ordinary mamamayan ang humiling na, maka, na makarinig sa akin tungkol dito sa issue na to. Kaya nga nasabi ko dun sa umpisa ng aking uh, salita na 
naging tunay na popular issue, popular issue ang territorial issue na ito for the very first time. Ngayon, yung sa tanong naman na kung hindi nga ito, kung hindi ito soberania, uh, ano ito? Ang punto nga doon is that uh, ay, ang, ang iyong soberania ay maraming mga uh, uh, dito? mga kumpuni, mga parte. Maraming aspeto ito. No? At kung mayroon kang praktikal na problema, lalo na sa karagatan, kung saan hindi mo siya mababakuran, hindi mo siya mababantayan 24 oras hanggat hindi ka nandun, kung saan, kung wala kang bangka, hindi mo mararating yung lugar na yon. At kahit may bangka ka, baka, baka maanod ka, hirap na hirap kang manatili sa isang lugar lang. Yung ganong klaseng problema, hindi ito parang problema ng nandito lang tayo sa lupa. Maraming uh, hadlang dun sa ganong klaseng uh, pananaw. No, at yung mga ginagamit nating paningin, ginagamit nating diskarte sa mga problema dito sa lupa, hindi po pwede pagdagat ang pinag-usapan. Ngayon, yung, yung baho di Masinlok, nakita nyo naman, hindi, hindi to islang may mga puno na matatayuan mo. Yung, yung mismong isla doon, siguro hindi, hindi sinlaki man lang nitong stage na to. Kaya dapat, pag, kung, ganun ka, kung ganun yung sitwasyon, isipin mo uh, anong diskarte ang kailangan mo dyan. No? Mayroon ka ngang soberenia, legal yon na konsepto, pero lutang yon Ang practical na problema, kaya iba yung magiging approach mo dyan, iba yung magiging diskarte dyan. Kaya ganun naman yung, yung punto na nilalabas ko. Kailangan nating mag-isip ng, sa kakaibang paraan kung paano ito uh, harapin. Kasi nga, yung pagsabi natin lagi ng kailangan nating i-defend ang ating sovereignty and territorial integrity, the past three months ginagawa na po natin yan and ano nangyari sa atin. Ngayon, maari, siyang, maari nga maging dahilan pa yon para sabihin nung sina, o oh, sige, tatayong ko na lang yan. Ang ingay-ingay mo eh, tatayong ko na lang yan. ba diba? So, uh, diskarte. <laughs> Ika na, diskarte. One point lang okay? po. Hindi po ako nagpapatakot sa mahigante. Ang sinabi po ni Mr. Apostol, nung pumasok, ang nagsabi lang siya na tatayuan ni Leon, sinabi ni Incheck, sige, pag kayo ay eh, nagtayo dyan, tanggal ang inyong economic, ano. Ganon din gawin natin sa mga Incheck. Ang dami nilang investment dito, huwag na tayong bumili, ng kalaka ng Incheck, pag hindi yan umurong. Actually, uh, ma'am, maganda po yung mga tanong, ano, pero ang politically correct term po ngayon, eh, sino? Uh, let's uh, proceed from there. Okay, dalawang, ano pa ho, dalawang questions... Actually, uh, just the, the lady in the black shirt and then the gentleman from the office of Congressman Biazon. So the lady first, black shirt. My name is Liza Ting. Reyes po. I'm a Filipina married to a Chinese. I came from the Corps of Sponsors, Vanguard. Uh, Corps Commander po namin si Dandy Padua. <laughs> that was many years ago. Um, ang question ko po, because I, I've been to other forums uh, held by the DFA on the similar issues, and um, as a concerned citizen po, I really would like to find out who is heading the practical approaches for these things instead of just the philosophical. I have a tendency to agree with Rear Admiral Adamag that what we need is actual action. Ano po? So, for example, uh, when we're talking about the legal things, these are not the only uh, territories that the Philippines has in question. June 22, 1962, 50 years ago, we filed a claim to Sabah, Malaysia. And, re and yet, uh, there has been no action on this claim. They are pumping $50 billion of our oil and spending it. Okay? Ito po mga projected na reserves pa lang huyan. Okay? Uh, we, have, we do have claims, other territorial claims. We have not... Uh, uh, we have not... Um, manifested the political will to act on these claims. Philosophically, maybe. Okay, I belong to a group of about 60,000 uh, overseas Filipinos who get in touch with others, with each other, via social networking. But we are in groups, and we are um, very concerned about the integrity of the sovereignty of the Philippines because it is part of our identity. Kahit na po ako ay halo-halo na po ang aking dugo, I'm a direct descendant of the pirate Limahong. Okay? Tigalingga yan po kami. Alright? 400 plus years na po yung pamilya namin dito. Pero identity po namin, 
and, and the identity of the other Filipinos who are global now rests in what has the Philippines done with the baseline law and how does this impact this? It has a psychological effect on us. Okay? Tapos po, so practically, who is heading the media campaign for this? If the media, let's say some reporter picks up a soundbite from here, they put whatever there, and then they'll say later it's agitating. Why, who is in charge po of having the correct information and getting it to the right groups of concerned people who want to do something about it? Practical issues po, not philosophical. For example, we were trying to determine what is the economic benefit of the Panatag Shoal. The Chinese always claim their fisher, they want their fishermen to have access to it. Then can we not give benefits to our, as a fishing power, to our fishing taipans to also send their boats there? Have the Navy, maybe some Navy people in their boats to flash information if necessary? Give them incentives to do it, put buying stations. To, so that the produce, even the, even the small-time fishermen, let them crowd that place. Let them crowd the others. If, if, we, if this is necessary for our protein sourcing, we can use it as an excuse. It is not military, it is not, it is, but it is our practical security. We cannot, um, we cannot just uh, give up because it does... Uh, for example, which forum would we elevate this to anyway? China sits in the Security Council. The U.S. sits in the Security Council. So who would we elevate? What, what international forum? We should do something for ourselves. It's our children we have to feed. It's our generations. It's us who needs a place to live. Yes. Okay? So, parang ang, so my question is, like I was very happy when by accident I found out that there was this, uh, this forum today can we not have more, um, can we not have on a, uh, correct information shared with as many of the concerned citizens as possible? They will, they will be able to come up with solutions. Okay, 20, thinking 20 years back is not far enough. The World War II, yes, we need to learn from there. We can, I agree with, with, uh, with um, uh, Rear Admiral Adamag. Whenever China wants territory, it will go to war, okay? Even against its own citizens. Only in 1949, they seized all the private properties of their own citizens. They can seize anything they want, all right? So talking about it, denying it, this is, it's, a, it's a fact. It's a historical fact. It has nothing to do with the economics now. If they want, you know, they have nuclear submarines, they fired a missile off the coast of the United States, they can do what they want against the United States. But in the meantime, it's us, 100 million Filipinos that need to live, have a decent lifestyle with dignity here. What are the practical things that we can do? Somebody has to take control of the information, disseminate it to our generation and, and below, because this is their country. And they will, they, they will do the right things, not the philosophical things, but the practical right things. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Rear Admiral, sir, could we have her appointed to government? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, a short reply, sir. Uh, yes, uh, we should, uh, right now, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, the one uh, leading, leading our... Uh, uh, in, uh, the one, the one uh, doing all the information dissemination, as well as looking for the right uh, diplomatic uh, courses of action. It's good that we have uh, uh, Dr. J. Batumbakal here. Even me, no? uh, yung, when he explained the, the basis of our claim in Panatag, it's my first time to know. Much more lalo na yung mga sundalo, no? Because yung mga sundalo, talagang, they will just uh, follow the orders of the superiors, no? But, really, it's really uh, how you explain to the people, no? how you explain to the common uh, masa, common tao, what we are fighting for. Yun ang mas magandang, ano? That's the better alternative, No? So even me, I'm learning from this, uh, from this forum. Now, only now that I know that uh, that is Treaty of Paris lang alam ko. Now it's uh, Treaty of Washington, no? So from here we learn a lot. 
So I agree. I agree with the with the proposal of uh, uh, the lady that okay, just uh, mentioned. Okay. Uh, very good, sir. Very good suggestion. Prof uh, Professor Jay, expect yourself to be invited uh, to the AFP to present this. <laughs> okay, last two questions. The lady, uh, you're the final um, one <laughs> to ask. You. The gentleman okay. first, and then you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, AIDS before beauty, yeah. It's, it's AIDS before beauty, yeah. Okay. I'm uh, Manuel Ibanez. I'm from the office of uh, Congressman Biaswan. He is the chair of uh, the House of Representatives uh, Committee on National Defense and Security. He really wanted to attend uh, this, uh, this meeting. Unfortunately, he has uh, previously scheduled the uh, engagement. Just for uh, the information of the group, uh, he is the principal author of uh, a proposed bill which seeks to amend the uh, Republic Act 7898, which is the Armed Forces Modernization Act. Uh, one of the primary provisions of the proposed bill is the allocation of 75 billion pesos for the first five years of the modernization program. No? Uh, and it, will, uh, it aims to develop uh, a ship team capability of the armed forces to meet internal and external security threats. Well, it's a start. We have 75 million. Hopefully, we get it. Okay. Uh, before I forget, I would like to thank the three speakers for uh, their uh, enlightened presentation, and I do not intend to make the fourth presentation. I'll just uh, give some comments. No? It will be one minute or two minutes. Stop me if I uh, go beyond uh, one and a half minutes. Okay? Thank you for giving me that uh, privilege, sir. General uh, Admiral Agdamag said that the marching order is to defend uh, the shoal. Okay. The next question is, how do we defend? Okay. Uh, you can answer it later if you want. If it is, the answer is confidential, then I will not uh, compel you to answer. Okay. Maybe what Admiral uh, will say is, uh, it's a rhetorical question. Uh, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Uh, second question. Uh, the, the second uh, observation is, uh, or the second question is, do you have cognizant commanders in the area? No. Uh, which would exercise sufficient discretion in order to not to make this or to exacerbate the situation. I am uh, no, concentrating on the military aspect of national security. We leave the technical, the economic, and the political, and the social to the members of the academy and to the expert. Okay. Because right now, I know, alam natin, sa nating goods tong pumunta, nasaan tayo, at paano tayo makakarating doon. Alam natin lahat yan. Okay, alam natin lahat. Okay. I think these are the only things which uh, I would like to ask uh, the, the presenters. No? And uh, just an addendum to this, to this historical snippets uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Batumbakal and uh, Admiral uh, Agdamag. Dr. Batumbakal mentioned something about the marginal line, but that's in Europe. We go closer to Asia. They developed uh, Singapore as a formidable uh, fortress. But the Japanese side stepped it. They invaded from behind. So all the guns of Singapore were pointed towards the sea. Okay. In so far as the partitioning concerned, apparently the Chinese are very fond of uh, drawing lines. In order to establish their, uh, their territory, it brought to mind the problem regarding the partitioning of India, no? of uh, Pakistan. Okay. Time, sir. Time? Okay, I'll stop. No, just yeah. finish, wrap yes, up. Sir. Just done, okay. You know, when you just draw a line, it uh, brings about problems. No? So the Pakistani, Indian, and uh, British authorities were finding it hard to come up with a solution. So they imported a diplomat, a security expert, and a National Defense University graduate from England to, to resolve the matter, to come up with a solution. So he came over to India. He studied it for one night, then he presented the solution to the authorities. He merely drew a line across India, and he said, this is Pakistan. So the following day, an Indian found his living room in India and his dining room in Pakistan. So that's, that's, that's uh, one thing we have to, be, you know, to, we have to consider, in so far as the, the, the acts of the Chinese in drawing lines are concerned. It usually brings about problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Any of our speakers?
Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, let me answer the first the modernization. No? Uh, right now, we have a timetable of uh, 2013 of uh, turning over our ISO, Internal Security Operations, from uh, the Armed Forces of the Philippines to the uh, Philippine National Police. In so doing, uh, we're preparing our uh, soldiers, our the Armed Forces of the Philippines, for external defense. That's why uh, I think uh, for the past uh, three presidents, no, only President Aquino has has given that much. I think uh, more than uh, 50 billion already was given to the armed forces for modernization. That's where we have the uh, 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 the Hamilton class uh, ship that we're using right now. Uh, the helicopters we're using for the Air Force. So many more equipment are coming in, and uh, I think the President understands the situation. Hindi naman pwedeng bigla-bigla na ano eh, magkarunta ng equipment. You need the training, you need the preparation, you need the planning. So I think uh, the President understands the problem and the situations very well. And... Uh, I think uh, right now the Philippines is spending about 0.85% of our GDP for, uh, for the armed forces of the Philippines. That's very little when other countries are spending about 1.5% of their GDP. So napaka-laki nung, ano, no? napaka-laki nung discrepancy between uh, uh, our, our, uh, our neighbors in the ASEAN and uh, in the Philippines. And uh, I'm so happy to hear that uh, uh, Congressman Biason is uh, is doing his best to uh, uh, for for the uh, uh, the new modernization law for the armed forces of the Philippines. Just uh, 20 seconds, in so far as uh, what he said is concerned. No, I don't think no personally that is his opinion. But personally, my perception of the matter is that we will not be able to transfer. Uh, matter on, on internal security, no? uh, meeting the threat of internal security within a period of three years, from 2013 to 2016. That's the reason why it was, uh, it was transferred from the PNP to the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Whereas initially, internal security matter became the responsibility of the PNP. But apparently, they encountered the problem, so it was transferred back. It was returned to the uh, Armed Forces of the Philippines. And right now, the Armed Forces of the Philippines is involved not only in internal security, but in external security as well. Okay, sir. Thank you. So our final question, uh, ma'am. Thank you. I'm Melissa Loha. I'm from, I work for the University of Hong Kong, but I do not take the side of China. I work for a professor who comes from the UN, an American professor. I have two points. I take the side of Professor Jay by saying that the focus now of the Philippine strategy should not be based on sovereignty, but on some other interests, such as environmental protection. While the reactor, retired General Agdamag, is taking the view that the focus should still be on territorial sovereignty. My question is, I'm wondering if the National Security Council is giving advice to the president based on a long line of jurisprudence coming from the International Court of Justice as well as ITLAS. Specifically, in 2009, Ukraine versus Romania, the issue of territorial sovereignty over islands and maritime features was ignored in the limitation. Bangladesh versus Myanmar, the issue also of territorial sovereignty over islands and maritime features was ignored in the limitation. Third, the point raised by Professor Jay that we should weigh the value of territory economically is very, is very important because in the case of Eritrea versus Yemen, the ICJ considered the fishing interests of Yemen in order to adjust the equidistance maritime line. So if we, if we focus on other interests, 
not just territorial sovereignty, and make these interests the principal defining point of our policies, we might get somewhere in the international law arena. At the same time, we might be able to convince China to sit down before the ICJ or ITLOS by pointing out that in these cases, Romania versus Ukraine, Yemen versus Eritrea, Myanmar versus Bangladesh, and many others, Gulf of Maine, etc. I'm sure Jay would know this. The, the island features within the sea were, were ignored to adjust the delimitation, the boundary lines. So I'm, I'm just asking this question whether the director of national security is aware of this jurisprudence and whether the president is given sufficient advice about this jurisprudence. And it's just not jurisprudence as well. It's also state practice in terms of maritime delimitation by bilateral agreements. And these are done in the Black Sea as well as the Mediterranean Ocean. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, your short replies, gentlemen, whoever. Yes, uh, actually, the jurisprudence on islands is precisely the reason why back in 2001, uh, in one of the workshops of the UPILS uh, with the NSC at the time, we had recommended the, that the Kalan Island Group and Scarborough Shoal be placed under the island, regime of islands, Article 121, rather than made part of the archipelagic baselines. And that recommendation at the time is exactly what was enacted into law more than what, a decade later in RA 9522. So you see actually the, there is a bit of filtering that's going on and those have been considered. That's also why earlier I pointed out the danger of going into a litigation because the, it actually endangers the position that has already been established based on that original strategy or recommendation from long ago. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, we're, we're, we're out of time. I'm about to make an announcement. For those of you, Brad, sorry, yeah. sorry, Brad. <laughs> I have to be blunt and we, we have to end uh, this sometime. But you can ask your questions and you can get a copy of the report. By the way, our rapporteur for this lecture is Professor Solomon F. Lumba. Uh, my, I'm proud to say my classmate and former secretary of the college. Uh, I'm, give, I'm, gonna give, I'm going to give to you the email of the UPVI, and if you email them your questions, or if you email them asking for a copy, a report of the proceedings to, uh, this morning, uh, UP Vanguard uh, Center for Strategic Studies will provide you uh, your answers uh, from the, uh, our speakers and um, a copy of the report. So here it is, uh, if you can write it down, UPVI 1922 underscore secretariat. Again, UPVI uh, lowercase, UPVI1922 underscore secretariat at yahoo.com. Okay, we, we now proceed to uh, the closing of our program. Uh, by the way, after uh, our um, Honorable G G General here uh, gives his uh, a closing remark, kindly stay for our singing of the UP Naming Mahal. Um, We'd like to call on Lieutenant General Jaime S. de los Santos, retired. He's the, presently the president of the Hans Kushler Political and Philosophical Society. But uh, to all of those in the know, uh, he gained, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say notoriety, but uh, he became famous uh, because he was the force commander of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in East Timor. Uh, General, sir. Good morning to all of you. Let us all congratulate Dr. J. Batumbakal and the two <laughs> reactors, Admiral Damag and Professor Kraft, for their very informative and very incisive uh, lectures on the subject matter. I also would like to congratulate two organizations, namely the UB Vanguard and the Hans Kessler Philosophical and Political Society. By the way, the organization is named after a famous professor who is an expert, a UN expert, on conflict resolution. And he comes to the Philippines every now and then, and mostly the members come from the UP community. Anyway, 
Our topic is about China. And to tell you frankly, I've been exposed to a little bit about China because when they were growing to be a power, they started developing their network all over the world. So they established what they call as the China Association of International Friendly Contact, where they invite a lot of personalities from different parts, parts of the world and give them a tour and all the amenities in China. And usually they invite retired defense and military officials. And in one occasion, in many occasions, I've been invited. And also, I was invited to be a lecturer at the Academy of uh, Military Science in Beijing. So earlier, there was a point whether we shall defend the Scarborough Shore or not. And it seems that we have so many views. But basically, if it's our own, then we should fight for it. But we are not prepared. Rather, we are not prepared physically, but we should be prepared mentally. We must have that mental wherewithal. And presently, we are a nation with very weak values, especially from the point of view of nationalism and from the point of view of patriotism. I would like to mention, for example, that in the case of the youth before, we have compulsory ROTC. I mention this because we are celebrating the centennial year of the ROTC. And I recall before, everybody were required to take up ROTC. Although I'm not saying that we should require everyone. But what I would like to mention is that we must develop the values of leadership among our citizens. Because what we lack is leadership manifests and manifests and express leadership, not only from the youth, but also from our leaders. We should have one mind. If you will look at, for example, Israel, or if you will look at Singapore, they have one focus, and that is their nation. But here, we have diverse focus, and especially this diverse focus have different interests. What we need really basically is, first, is, of course, the mental attitude, the psychological wherewithal wherein we should always win, even if we, have, we, we lack the capability. As they say, if on our way to our destination, we shall listen to the barking of the dogs, then we will never reach our destination. Now earlier, if in case China will invade the islands, what can we do? Probably we will just end up being Chinese citizens. But I'd like to cite an, cite an example, for example. No? Before, it must be the express, uh, express uh, mandate of the UN to be able to accomplish something. And in 1976, Indonesia invaded East Timor and annexed it as their 37 province, 37 or 27. And from 1976 up to 21 before they uh, 2002 before they became independent, nothing happened. So in the same manner, if the Chinese will occupy this Scarborough, we go to the United Nations and complain, probably it will take many generations before they will listen. So we must prepare now. We must prepare one of us and all of us will have to understand the problem. And even if we lose, at least we are fighting. We must be able to develop that mental attitude, that mental attitude of victory to be able to accomplish our vision, as I, I, and as uh, Admiral said, to be, able to, uh, to be able to satisfy the welfare of our men. Now, for your information, uh, the UP Vanguard is celebrating its centennial this year. And we have lined up a lot of uh, programs. One of them is a committee for strategic studies, which eventually will evolve into a center. And with that, we shall be able to make more study and assessment on various issues pertaining to our nationalism, pertaining to our patriotism, and pertaining to our survival and the greatness of the Filipino nations. Magandang umaga sa inyo lahat. General, now I know why the UN made you commander. Um, be before we sing uh, our uh, dear uh, UP Naming Mahal, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, first of all, the UP Vanguard Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, all of you who came here, uh, especially the members of the UP Vanguard fraternity, and most especially um, the Board of Governor uh, members uh, who are here, Board of Governors members who are here. Okay, um, our speakers, uh, Professor Jay. 
Uh, we are very impressed, sir. Uh, thank you. Ari Admira Agdamag, thank you, sir. Uh, are you sharing your material? <laughs> your presentation? <laughs> because those were good slides you showed, General. <laughs> uh, Admiral. Uh, and uh, Professor Kraft, uh, it's always an honor. So may we invite everyone to please stand for the singing of our UP Naming Mahal. Again, it's one of my duties to please you with my voice. We, we don't have any audio for this. So this is a cappella again. So, UP Naming Mahal, handa, awit. UP Naming Mahal, Pamanta sang hirang Ang tinig namin Sana'y inyong dinggin Malayong lupain Amin mang marating Di Bago ang damdamin Di rin magbabago ang damdamin Luntian at pula sa gisag magpakailanman Ating pagdiwang Bulwagan ng dangal Humayot itanghal Giting at tapang Mabuhay ang pag-asa ng Bayan, mabuhay ang pag-asa ng bayan. Nanya ako po kayo sa isang bagsak. Mabuhay ang Pilipinas! Buhay! Maraming salamat po. Have a nice day.